Welcome to another fun-filled edition of the weekend edition of Second City Sports Zoom Style. Zoom Style. Along with Miss Lakina McGee, I am Sydney Brown. You can follow yours truly on the Twitter and the IG at CK80. Once again at CK80, that's S-I-D-K-I-D-80. That's S-I-D-K-I-D-80. You can follow me at Keita McGee on the Twitter and at Keita underscore McGee on the IG. You can follow this podcast, Second City Sports, first right here on YouTube at War Media. Once again at W-A-R-R Media. Videos drop every Monday and every Friday. Once again, videos drop every Monday and Friday right here on YouTube at War Media. Once again at W-A-R-R Media. Our audio version uh, i.e. the podcast version drops every Tuesday and every Saturday at War on Anchor. Once again at W-A-R-R on Anchor every Tuesday and every Saturday. We're, on, we're available on all podcast platforms, including the iHeartRadio app. Make sure you type in that search engine box, W-A-R-R on Anchor. And you can go to our website, weareregalradio.com for more information. And you can follow us on all social media platforms, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and right here on YouTube at War Media. Once again, at W-A-R-R Media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And thank you very much in advance for your support. Like, share, subscribe, and tell your friends. Subscribe, subscribe, yeah, so subscribe. We, yes. <laughs> and we are unapologetically fun. And let's kick off this episode, Lakino, with discussing my favorite baseball team, the 34-22 and 22 as of this recording. First place, Chicago White Sox. Uh, here's the the beat writer for the Chicago White Sox for the Chicago Tribune. And we finally got it to make it work. And let's bring on the incredible and talented Mr. Lamont Poe. Lamont, welcome to the program. How are you today? Oh, thank you very much. Thanks for those kind words. I'm very well. How are you two doing? Doing good. We're doing Real just good. fine. Where can people find you on social media? I can be found at, uh, on Twitter at Lamont Pope, uh, L-A-M-O-N-D-P-O-P-E. And then all my work is at uh, chicagotribune.com. All right. Nice, Let's nice. get this started. As of this recording, the White Sox are 34 and 22 first place in the American League Central Div- Division. Uh, they are currently taking on the, the Detroit Tigers uh, in the four-game weekend series. They defeated the Tigers in the first game. Uh, on Thursday by the score of four to one. Lamont, before we break everything down, give us your quick assessments uh, of this uh, White Sox team this season going through the adversity with the whole Tony La Russa quote-unquote incident. For those of you listening exclusively on our podcast, we'll get into that, I'm sure, in this conversation. But going through that, going through the injuries with Eloy Jimenez, Adam Engel, who should be back soon, and Luis Robert, give us your two cents about the White Sox uh, uh, start so far through the first two months of the season. Yeah, I mean, you know that they're with the injuries. I mean, this is a team that entered the season with high expectations, obviously making the playoffs last year for the first time since 2008. The expectations were, were up a little longer, higher with, you know, adding Liam Hendricks, adding Lance Lynn. There's this expectation this team can make, to take that next step, you know, make another step in the playoffs, possibly get to the World Series. And then the injuries. I mean, you start off with losing someone like Eloy Jimenez. I mean, this guy, he, you know, he made such great strides from year one to year two. And the sky's the limit for Eloy. I mean, not only just with the power, but also just the, the ability with the bat. I mean, sure, his defense needed a little more work, still needs a little more work. As we saw, I mean, that was, that was the case that led to the injury. But offensively, just such uh, and, and also in the clubhouse, just a great guy to be around, just always has a smile on his face. And that rubs off on the team in the right way. And then you lose someone like Luis Robert, who was making so much progress here in year two as well. I mean, that, that's, those are two dynamic bats that you're losing out of the lineup. And anytime, you know, it's, it's not like you're, you know, anytime that any team loses two regulars, that's one thing. But when you lose two guys that you expect to have so much production, I mean, you know, that could, in some cases, lead to a tailspin. But this team, first place, because, A, the starting pitching has been Phenomenal. I mean, just everybody in the rotation, you, you, you recognize that you got, you're you going to have Lance Lynn, you're going to have Lucas Giolito, you have Dallas Keigel, three guys that, um, you know, earned Cy Young Awards votes last year. So, you know, the top of the rotation, everything was going to be solid. But you add on in what Carlos Rodon has done. Just lights out, fantastic uh, start of the season, and he's given the team what they expected when they drafted him as a number three overall pick in 2014. He's just been phenomenal. The bullpen is starting to show those signs. Of, you know, everyone had high expectations for the bullpen. They're starting to show those signs. We saw that last night with Bummer, 
Marshall, and then Hendrix at the at the close close things on out. You know, Hendrix is such a character, uh, but he, you know, he he's been fantastic for the team as well. And so the pitching has led the way, and the offense just getting contributions from guys that you know, your Mercedes coming out of nowhere for for April had that fantastic start to the season. Uh, and the, you know, the last week it, it was the Billy Hamilton show, right? Home run on, on yeah. Saturday, home run on yeah. Sunday, and the little league home run there on Tuesday. And then last night you get uh, Jake, Jake Lamb hitting a home run, and he's, he's been able to produce as well. And so, so it's been contributions from guys that you haven't expected that have aided the offense, and obviously you get the regular guys with um, Mancata and Abreu doing their things as well, and that's how you got a team that still is in first place. Now, Lamont, how about the middle relief? I mean, that's sort of been the thing that's kind of been the point of contention for me this whole season. They've been kind of up and down. Some guys have been better than others. So the guys that have not been right, do you think they can actually write the ship and be kind of like that cohesive unit that this team needs in order to kind of, you know, if they want to get to the other ALCS and perhaps the World Series? Yeah, I mean, you know, the bullpen is always one of those things, you know, obviously it was one of the team strengths last year and, and everyone expected it to be one of the team strengths this year once again. But, you know, bullpen's always so tricky. From year to year, they can fluctuate. You know, one year it looked really, really great. Next year kind of looked, you know, sort of middle of the pack. The, the talent is there. You, know, you got Cody Hart, particularly like we were talking about with the guys in the middle, uh, middle of the rotation, middle of that bullpen there. You know, Cody Hoyer, uh, Evan Marshall, uh, uh, Aaron Bummer. You know, the, the, the talent is, is there for those guys. You know, Garrett Crochet. You know, the one guy that has uh, helped on out in that, in that sort of role has been Michael Kopech. I mean, he has just been so phenomenal in, in that making that transition from being, you know, starter. Obviously, the long-term plan for Michael is to get in that starting rotation, and we we saw what he's been able to do in three spot starts. Uh, but but when he's been called upon out of the bullpen, he's been really really solid. He's been the most probably the most consistent guy in that middle relief uh, type of role. But you know, I expect. Aaron Bummer to be Aaron Bummer. I expect uh, Evan Marshall to be Evan Marshall. And you saw that last night. Both those guys, two strikeouts in their one inning of work. And so th those are the signs that the team can expect. And I believe that's the way that those guys are going to perform, you know, going forward for the Sox the rest of this way. White Sox beat reporter for the Chicago Tribune, Mr. Mal Lamond Pope, is joining us here on the weekend edition of Second City Sports, along with Lakina McGee and Sidney Brown. Lamond, let's st stay with that White Sox pitching rotation for a moment let's go to the stars of course Lance Lynn did the job on Thursday uh, in his uh, previous start against St. Louis he almost pitched a no hitter it looks like uh, if the playoffs started today he'll be the consensus number one uh, starter the game one starter who would be your uh, your game two starter today would it be Carlos Rodon would it be Lucas Giolito who's turned it around over the last month or uh, will it be uh, Dylan C so who, who would you be your uh, who would be your game two starter today yeah, I, I'd honestly, I'd probably still, you know, the, the way that the rotation has been set on up, you know, with Lucas uh, getting the opening day star, uh, then Dallas Keuchel, and then Lance Lynn, I, I think that that's probably going to still be the way that they can go. And you know, that was one thing that cost the team last year in that playoff series against the Oakland A's. They didn't have that number three guy that they could depend upon mm -hmm. to go in that third game there. You know, they had, they had Lucas, he was phenomenal in, in the game one uh, there, you know, getting the win. Dallas, he, he had a little bit of off off out because he, he had such a strong regular season and his playoff performance wasn't up to his standard he talked about that uh you know we'll entering the season as well and so but but the fact that he has so much postseason experience that's something that can help but they, they really needed that third arm and lance has just been the guy that you can depend upon you know uh, after the game uh, last night uh, gosh money grand you know we, we asked him he's like well what what's what's made lance so special and it's just like and he said intent we're like okay can you kind of expound upon that? And it's like, you know, he has a purpose. He knows behind every single pitch what he's going to do. And he just attacks hitters. And that's what, and that's what we've seen. You know, his fastball, he's got a fastball. He's, he knows he's going to throw the fastball. The hitters know he's going to throw the fastball. But he has such purpose with every single pitch. You, you know, lets him make contact and, and works a quick game. And so Lance Lynn has been everything and more, I think, than what the team could ever expect. So, so I still think it's going to be sort of some. So that's going to be sort of the the, the makeup of that uh, rotation right now. As far as if you get to the postseason, I think it's still going to be Lucas number one, uh, Dallas probably number two, Wentz Lynn three, and then the fourth guy will be Carlos Rodon with the way that he's been able to throw. I mean, his April was just phenomenal. You know, again, when we talked during spring training 
uh, to Dallas Keiko, one thing that he said is like, you know, this is the, this was the this was the uh, Carlos Rodon that the White Sox drafted. They, they saw it in spring training. Yeah. He's been able to carry it on over to the regular season, and he's been a guy that the team has, has been able to depend upon. You know, Dal, uh, Dylan Cease. You know, again, a situation the other night there in Cleveland. That first inning, a little bit of bad luck, right? You had a yeah. drop third strike, a couple of infield hits. Um, and, and that and that kind of you know like a little bit of trouble there. And when you and when you're facing someone like Shane Bieber, you know every little every little small thing can lead up. You know it's going to be costly. Um, but but Dylan has been r- really solid from from start to start. You know obviously the last one you know only lasting uh, three and a third inning. And so he wants to you know get a little big thing for for Dylan is just uh, you know being him that fastball command. If he has that fastball command, if he's if he's around the strike zone, you know, not walking guys, you know, because I think, you know, like I said, three to 30 through 94 pitches, you know, he knows yeah. that that's, that's not the formula that's mm-hmm. going to lead to success. And so, so if he can just get consistent throwing the strikes, he's can, he, he has all the tools to be a very, very solid pitcher as well. How phenomenal has your Mercedes been? I mean, I think he just hit another home run, I think, you know, just now. But, uh, I mean, how, how phenomenal has he been? <laughs> I mean, you know, getting those big hits, you know, you know, small ball, long ball. How, you know, and this is really, like, basically his first, like, full season in the majors. Can he keep this up? Yeah, the, the, the big thing, I mean, you mean, like, they, they needed somebody – with that offense when Eli went down. You know, everyone was wondering what was going to be the step that the team was going to take. Who was going to be the person that was going to step up in, into the mix? You know, the, the funny thing is, who knows if Mercedes makes the team if Eli's healthy because they really needed another stick when Eli went down. They, they added uh, Mercedes to the roster, made up an indie roster. You know, he, he was planning, probably the initial plan was just going to be kind of work him out into the mix, have him DH some, have Jake Lamb DH some, work some of the other guys into that role. Um, and he stole the show. I mean, first game out of the bat, bat or first start out of the bat in game two, five for five. You know, first eight eight times at the plate, eight hits, a major league record, and, and he didn't slow down for that first month of April. You know, he, he's he's had a little bit of a of a, of a, a slow down a little bit here recently. Uh, we had a talk with uh, Tony LaRusso before yesterday's game, and he said the big thing is just you know. One thing that you're kind of taught literally, just you know, make sure you keep your head down on the ball. And he said sometimes his head's kind of flying, flying away. And so, so the big thing is just kind of get back to those basics for your me. You know, he, he has you know not only the ability to hit, but the ability to hit with two strikes. It's something that um, you know some of these guys, you know, Nick, you know, everyone talks about Nick Madrigal and his ability to hit with two strikes. That's been one of the strengths for your me at Mercedes as well. Is, you know, his ability to, you know, he cuts down on his, his strike there with two strikes and he's been able to just make contact and, and have some success from that standpoint. But it's a little bit getting back to those basics, you know, kind of kind of going over those little things, making sure you have your head down, eye on the ball and connect and they can kind of, kind of get back on track and be the Mercedes that everyone saw in that first month as well. Sis, Lakina brought up uh, Yerman Mercedes Lamont. I had to bring up that controversy I'm using air quotes here mm-hmm. of uh, what happened a couple of weeks ago at Target Field in Minnesota and how Tony La Russa handled that situation. I want to get your thoughts on that and I mean, what do you think about these quote-unquote unwritten rules in the game of baseball? Yeah, I, I think the unwritten rules, you know, they, they should just gather them all up and just toss them out the window. I mean, I just, <laughs> I've never really been a big fan of those. You know, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the notion is, you know, you know I, I love watching guys like Tatis play. You know, obviously, love watching someone like Tim Anderson play. You know, just, just the, the, the joy that they have playing the game and the fun that they have in playing the game. And it just, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an added aspect to the game that everyone really like and that I personally really, really like watching as well. Um, so, so in, in that case, you know, it was, it was a situation, I, I, you know, being at the ballpark that night, first off, it, you know, obviously big blowout lead for the Sox. Game's practically over. You know, I'm writing my story. Um, Mercedes hits the home run off of uh, the Twins utility player. And, and the, you know, the, the, there really wasn't a sense while that was happening in the, in the moment, you know, at the ballpark, you know, the fans didn't, like, automatically start booing. They didn't say, hey, that was a 3-0 pitch. Why are you swinging? You know, there, there was nothing <laughs> like that. Uh, you know, obviously, one of, the, one of the Twins announcers, he brought it up right away. He was like, I don't, I don't know. But, but it's like, you know, that gained a little social media traction the next the next day, and I remember thinking, well, all right, well, you know, obviously it's the, the home team's announcers. They're, they're going to, you know, back up their guys, and that'll be that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we get to the ballpark, and we have the uh, – and they made your mean available, and he talked a little bit about hitting the home run and everything else. And then he gets done, and then Tony uh, gets up there, and he, and he you know, did what he did. <laughs> and I'm like, well, now this is a story. So, so. <laughs> 
that's the story you stick into so, it. So, <laughs> so it was, yeah. <laughs> So it became something that was like, it was one of those things like where it was a sort of a self-made distraction for the ball club that they had to deal with for, for about a week there. And, that, and, the, and those are the type of things that when, when things, you know, the team was rolling, you know, you, you had this big blowout victory against, you know, a team that you thought was going to be one of the uh, rivals as far as in, in the division. You know, obviously the Twins haven't been playing really good baseball, but, but anytime you can kind of gain distance, you know, or separation between the two, that, that's always a good thing. And so, uh, so that became a thing for, you know, like I said, you know, the, the rest of that series, the start of the New York uh, series as well. Um, and, and, but what it did, I think, is showed, showed everyone how much the players have each other's backs, right? Because mm-hmm. right off the bat, mm-hmm. you had uh, Anderson going on social media, uh, you know, supporting your mean. You had uh, Lucas Giolito after his start a couple days later saying, you know, we like home runs. And so like, so the fact that the players, you know, had each other's back and, and that, had to be a, that had, had to be a big boost for your mean as well. You know, the, the, the fact, knowing that, you know, some of these, some of the star players on the team, you know, that they're going to support you no matter what, you know, Lance Lynn also you know, showed some support there as well. And so the fact that those guys, you know, it, it brought the players that much closer together as well, because it, it was a situation where they're like, no, man, we got your back in this situation and in all situations as well. And so, so that, that, that was my biggest takeaway is that seeing the guys step up for each other, step up for your mean and, and, and working, working their way on through and just sort of, you know, trying to block out that noise, trying to block out that distraction and just continue to play baseball. Nick Madrigal, Lamont. I mean, he's one of those guys that, you know, White Sox fans love him when he does great stuff, when he does, you know, questionable stuff and odd stuff, you know, people hate him. Now, I guess, now I guess we're, we're back, you know, we're back to loving him. <laughs> White Sox fans are. So can he kind of keep up this sort of stride of actually doing good things, you know, getting timely hits, not making defensive mistakes? Yeah, I mean the, the big thing with um, with Nick Madrigal, as we were talking about earlier, with uh, your mean, it's that, that two strike ability, right? You know, sometimes when guys get two strikes on them, uh, they they tend to kind of you know, well, I guess the trend nowadays is if you you know two, if there's not going to be any difference between if you're swinging with two strikes or one strike or no strikes, you're just swinging for the fences, and that's been one of the problems why we've why we've had so many strikeouts in the game. There's, there hasn't been this, you know, what can I do with this two strike approach? Nick Madrigal from the from the jump has been able to kind of uh, establish his two-strike approach, know what he has to do, make contact. You know, he's, he's going to put the ball in play. And when you put the ball in play, more times than not, good things ha- happen. And that's been the case with Nick Madrigal. You know, the, the defense, I think, has, has gotten better. Um, you know, the, the base running, you know, it's still a thing that he's, he's working on as well. And so, you know, the, the, the thing like with Nick as well, he's someone that you can put – almost anywhere in the lineup. I mean, you, you can, you know, he's, he's obviously he's, for the most part, he's been in the number nine spot, but which almost served as almost like a second leadoff spot because you kind of turn that lineup on over and then you have uh, Tim Anderson at the top ready to go. But when, when Tim's needed a rest, they've, they've, they've put Nick at the number at the leadoff spot. They've also batted him in the number two spot sometimes, which I like, which I personally like as well, because I think the fact that he can make contact, make things work and with his bat, you know, that, that, that gives you the operation, it gives you a situation where you can do some hit and running. You can do some other things that you might want, not, might not do in other cases with someone else in the number two spot. And so, you know, the, the, the fact that he can do, do so many things at different parts of the batting order is a plus and something that's going to be beneficial for him in the long run as well. You're listening to the weekend edition of Second City Sports along with Lakina McGee. I am Sydney Brown. We're t- we are talking to Lamont Pope, Chicago White Sox beat writer for the Chicago Tribune. Lamont, let's focus in on another rookie. His name is Andrew Vaughn. Of course, he's a uh, making a, a, his adjustments at the plate. Uh, I think he's been better than advertised playing left field, something that we wanted Eloy Jimenez to do. Of course, now Eloy is currently injured. But talk to us about the power surge in Andrew Vaughn's vet over the last couple of weeks. Do you think he's finally turned the corner? Do you think he'll start to catch fire now? Yeah, everyone knew that You know, once, once the first one came, uh, that there would be more, and the one that stood out to me uh, was the one, you know, a couple weeks, a couple Sundays ago against uh, Chapman. You know, that ninth inning, uh, team shot, and also, and also that situation. Let's let's kind of take a little bit more step back. You know, facing them on on Friday. You know, that Friday at bat, yeah. uh, situation mm-hmm. tie game, mm-hmm. uh, and then and he hits uh. a triple play. Um, <laughs> yeah, not, not good, not good. But, <laughs> but but then he gets another opportunity, right? So, uh, Sunday. Uh, yeah, he gets that, gets he gets called upon in a pinch hit, hit situation, and he takes him out of the ballpark. I mean, that, that just shows you the kind of power and the kind of talent uh, that Andrew Vaughn has. And, and you're exactly right, Sammy. The the fact that he, you know you know he kind of yeah, he, he's a first base, he's a first baseman, natural first baseman. 
uh, you know, Eli goes down, and they're like, you know, we, you know, he, he did some work uh, last year in Schaumburg uh, playing, playing out in the outfield. And so, he, so that was sort of a little bit of a test, sort of an, oppor an opportunity for him to kind of see what it would be like out there. But it's different than, you know, Preston and Schaumburg is totally different than when you're in that triple-decker situation at a, ball, at a major league ballpark. Um, and the fact that he's been able to not only play like, you know, and you know, well, you know, he's 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 been an okay uh, left over. No, he, he's he's been a solid. It, it seems like he's been a, a veteran out there. Mm -hmm. You know, it just every everything that he's been able to attack. You know, he, he gave a lot of credit to guys like uh, uh, Luis. He gave a lot of credit to guys like Billy. Guys that you know, guys have been able to communicate with him as far as like you know, here here's you know, you you have this part to this part. You worry about these you know this section of of the outfield. I got the rest. You know, that was obviously, mm -hmm. obviously, Luis, you know, he'll go to left field and get one from, yeah, as we saw with, with Eli last year. He'll, <laughs> yeah. He'll get one. Um, but, but even with Billy, you know, Billy has great range as well. And so it's a situation where, you know, he's able to, he's been able to just concentrate on focusing on his area. And he's really done a really nice job from that standpoint. You know, obviously, uh, you know, some bad news this, this past week, uh, you know, yesterday being put on the injured list. And so it'll be interesting just to see how long he's going to be on out. But, but yeah, he, he's been, you know, Really good out in left field, you know, to the, to the point where it's like if, if they can make him a left fielder or a right fielder in the future, that that, that works. You know, obviously the first base is, is probably the long term plan, um, but you know, it, but the stick is coming along as well. And, and you, like you're correct, you know, showing some power, and that's that's a good sign for the team. But you know, obviously starting to heat on because of that you know early on in the season the team as a whole wasn't getting a whole lot of home runs, but now the team is you know, last night four solo home runs, and you're starting to see a little more power across the board, including with Andrew Vaughn. Do you think that Rick Hahn makes another move with the trade deadline as tr as the trade deadline approaches? Do you think they, you know, he tries to maybe get another middle relief guy or probably try to get a back end guy? Do you think Rick Hahn makes a move like that as a trade deadline approaches? Yeah, I, mean, I think you know a lot, of, a lot of people have wondered about, particularly offensively. Do you still need another? Uh, another bat, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, can you? I don't think the stats are depending on Billy Hamilton going yard, you know, night after night after night. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and, and so the situation where, you know, do you do, you know, as, as you get closer, are you are they going to be interested in trying to pick up an extra bat to, that can produce some, some more power? Uh, we had the chance to talk to Rick uh, before Tuesday's game out in Cleveland, and he said, you know, one thing that's that's good here is that they do have some time. Uh, there's a situation where, you know, they, they're still about a month away to kind of giving us the next update on both uh, Luis and Eloy. And then from that time, at that point in time, they can they kind of determine, all right, well, what, where are they at in their recovery? What are the next steps for them? Because honestly, if, if, if those guys can get back in August or, you know, early September, I mean, that's like making trades, right? I mean, it's like you're, you're adding two two great bats back into the lineup. I mean, that, that is, that's, that's the equivalent of, of going on out there and, and making the trade and not having to give up anything as well. Um, so, so that's something that, that'll be worth noting and worth watching, you know, in about a month from now when we get that sort of next update on, on both those two. As far as relief, yeah, you, you can all, you know, you can always use more help in, in the bullpen. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting just to see, you know, Chase Price coming on back eventually. He's, he's getting some work down uh, in Charlotte. And so it'll be interesting just to see what, you know, when he comes back, what happens with that mate. And also, you know, going forward as well, yeah, obviously with Michael Kopech back on the, on the injury list, list as well, when he gets back healthy, that's another added arm that they can kind of utilize in that, from that aspect as well. So, so you have some guys that are down right now that, that can be able to help on out when they get back from the injured list. But yeah, I think they're also going to be, you know, always have an eye open on to see who's available, both from the, the, the bullpen standpoint and also from the offense standpoint too. We're heading down the home stretch with Lamont Pope, the White Sox beat writer for the Chicago Tribune, right here on Second City Sports, along with Miss Lakina McGee. I am Sydney Brown. Lamont, let's focus it on uh, Johan Makata. Of course, last year he had his battles with Kobe. He had a, a terrible season, according to his standards. This year, he seems like he's starting to turn around. As of this recording, he's leading the team in batting average with a .299. Uh, talk about uh, his approach to the season, and, and do you see him as a potential all-star this year? Oh, I mean, no doubt. I mean, not only from the offensive standpoint, but he's, he's I mean, he has to be the gold glove leader. I mean, he, his defense over at third base has been phenomenal. Uh, yeah, it's, and, and last, last year he was a finalist in that category. And, and just watch, being able to watch him on a day-in and day-out basis, the way that he, you know, goes on in for, for some of those uh, slow rollers and makes those plays all the time. Just, just He's just been 
fantastic defensively, but offensively, yeah, the, his ability, you yeah, know, the, the great eye has always been there. Uh, you know, obviously the 2019 season, team, 2019 season was fantastic. Those, those are the signs. Those are, that's, that's what everyone thought that Mankata had the ability to do. You know, third in the AL in batting, uh, you know, career highs in home runs, RBIs as well. And so, and then obviously, like you said, the 2020 COVID, you know, and, he, and, he, and, the, and good for him for being really honest and open about it as well. You know, so, mm-hmm. you know he, yeah. he, he, he talked openly about how much it impacted him on a day-to-day basis is just how, how exhausted and how tired he was. I mean, we saw it, you know, I remember particularly a game in Cleveland, you know, I think he, I think he had a triple and then he came out and then scored and, and like he had, he was in Ricky Renteria was sort of fanning him off with a towel because, because he mm-hmm. was just, you had to catch yeah. his breath and he was so exhausted. And so, so the, the fact that, you know, he, he, can't, he entered this season uh, healthy, ready to go, and you're starting to see that production again. I mean, this is the Makata that everyone, uh, you know, it's sort of high expectations for, but, you know, going, going on through the farm system. And yeah, he, he's back to being able to produce at that type of level, all-star type level, definitely should be there in Colorado for the all-star game. He definitely should. I mean, just, if, you know, all the, you know, just like the numbers, he leaves a team in a lot of their offensive categories, nothing short of, of amazing what he, after he, what he went through last year. Um, you know, looking at their schedule, Lamont, I mean, they've got a pretty tough, you know, after this is series with Detroit, they have three, they host Toronto. You know, that's not going to be easy. They go back at Detroit, they host Tampa, they have four against Houston. You know, what's sort of like the most reasonable thing that we, that fans should expect from, you know, from the White Sox going up against those sort of top tier teams in the AL? Yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to watching those games because those will, those will all be very good tests. You know, obviously, you know, Toronto and their offense is just it's just been phenomenal. Guerrero and company. Um, yeah, the, the the Tampa Bay. I mean, yeah, the, 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 just a different variety of arms that they can throw in at you, and it just seems year after year those guys can able to produce and have a lot of success. You know, having a great season again this year. Had that recently that fantastic string of victories. Uh, I think it was like 16 to 17 or something along those lines. So, so and then and then going to Houston as well. You know, an opportunity for them kind of another test against against uh, Altuve and Bregman and all those guys as well. And so, so some really good opportunities just to sort of see where the Sox sort of stack on up with some of those other other elite teams outside of the division. You know, obviously, uh, you know, they went to New York. Um, you know, they, they lost all three games. Yeah, two of the games were really tight. You know, the, the Friday night game that we talked about, uh, you know, losing both those games a walk-off, a walk-off type fashion. And so, you know, this is an, another opportunity, another test for the team to have the opportunity to see, hey, you know, how, how do – how does the best in the American League Central stack up with some of the best, you know, in the American League East in the case of, of uh, Tampa and then also in the uh, AL West, you know, in, in terms of Houston. So I'm looking forward just to see, you know, what they do, matching up with these guys and, 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 and how, you know, because I believe the baseball is going to be a lot of fun to watch and it's going to be some really great games. Talk to us about the impact of Tim Anderson, Lamont. Of course, uh, we saw the fun in the personality that he, he displayed uh, last year, even though there was no fans in his stands. On, on, of course, those White Sox uh, on their, were on their way to the playoffs last year. This year, of course, with the winning, I know that many people don't consider him to be the best player on the team, but that's okay. But he's on the cover of, of, the, of a video game. He's, he's, for, for me, on the outside looking in, he seems that he likes embracing this role as the face of this team, though the leader in the clubhouse that likes to bring that attitude and that swagger to the, to the whole ball club. Talk to us about that. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, the, first off from, from the on the field aspect, you know, you know, you know, he's going to hit, right. Uh, here's mm-hmm. someone that he's a, he's a table setter at the top of the lineup and he's going to produce, he's going to get on base. He's going to you know, ignite the offense. And, that, and that's what he's been able to do. You know, hit the home run again uh, last night, one of the, one of the four. And so, so he's got, you know, the, the fact that you have someone like, Tim Anderson at the top of the lineup, you know, just sort of sets the tables, establishes things right off the bat, and gets the, gets the ball rolling from that aspect. But beyond that, yeah, the, the leadership aspect. Um, you know, Billy Hamilton has, has mentioned this several times. Like, you know, he, like, the Tim has been one of his biggest supporters right off the, right from the jump. Uh, you know, Billy has said, you know, you know, other places where he's gone, he's sort of struggled at, with, with the bat. You know, he's sort of been like a little bit of a slap hitter, just sort of put the ball on ground and just kind of run and u- utilize his life because that's, that's his strength. Uh, but he came here and right off the, and went right off the bat, Tim Anderson said, 
no, you're a hitter. You know, you know, just just kind of you know, hit line drives. You know, but just try to try to do all you can to, to be a, a pure hitter. And, and he really established and instilled a whole lot of confidence in Billy Hamilton. And and so Billy has been really thankful for that. And that's just an example, one example of sort of the leadership that Tim Anderson has been able to provide for this team. Um, it, defensively, he he's continued to improve. I mean, you know, to go from 2019, where he led the majors in errors, to where he is now, you know, he's 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 made such tremendous strides from that defensive standpoint as well. And so you're seeing someone who continue. You know, obviously the, the the stick has produced over over the last handful, you know, last three years. But the, but to see the, the complete ball player that he's continued to become and he's continuing to work at has been very nice to watch, and it's been beneficial for the Sox. Last question from me, Lamont. Do you do you think that any of these you know any of these players are deserving of perhaps any you know AL MVP or Cy Young? Maybe Lance Lynn could be a Cy Young contender. Do you think there's any chance that they could contend for one of those awards? I know I know like you know the team you know the AL Central and they have bigger things, but do you think that with all the numbers, do you think they have a chance of perhaps being in contention for the oh, these some of these awards? Yeah, I mean that'll be interesting just to see how the how the rest of the season plays on out. You mentioned Lance Lynn, and he's he's just been phenomenal. Um, I think I think the one point two three ERA through ten starts is like the fourth low, lowest in through ten starts for a Sox starter in team history. Uh, so so you know obviously seven to one record, and he's just been, he's been able as we, as we talked about earlier, just been able to do everything that the team has wanted to, for and more. And so so you know, obviously he's gonna he's gonna get some votes if he continues to play perform at the level that he's been performing at. Um, you know from the offensive standpoint, you know, I'm, I'm sure you obviously again once again Jose Abreu, the 2020 American League MVP, you know, uh, right near the top again in RBI, has been able to. Pr- produce those type of numbers. I'm, I'm sure Moncada is going to get some votes, you know, if he continues to progress the way that he's progressing because both offensively and defensively, as we talked about, he's just been someone who's been able to uh, do, do, do a little bit and do a lot of, little, little bit of a lot of things. Uh, I'm sure, you know, if, if, if Michael Kopech um, gets on back and gets healthy and, and, and continues to produce the way he's going to, been producing, he's going to get some uh, rookie of the year votes. You know, he's going to be able to make some te- the kid from Texas is having such a great season. Um, so, so he's probably going to be the favorite for that one. But yeah, you, you have, you, so, so these guys are, you know, they, they have enough, the talent is there to, <laughs> to be recognized, mm-hmm. uh, but it's just, yeah, kind of, kind of expanded on out. Uh, you know, they did for the first two months of the season. Let's see if they can expand it on out for the, for the remainder of the season as well. And we'll see, you know, how the ball, how, how that all falls on out as far as some of those uh, postseason rewards. Last question for me, Lamont. Uh, I had the privilege to uh, go back to, uh, to the ballpark uh, for the first time for me personally in about almost two years uh, in, in, in that series against Baltimore last Saturday and, and last Sunday. Of course, last Saturday's, Saturday's games, uh, it looked like it was a, a sellout crowd, even though it was up to 60% capacity. Of course, the Tim Anderson bobblehead day <laughs> bobblehead giveaway was a big help. I got minus, by the way. But um, it seems uh, by, this, by this time next week, uh, the, the restrictions will be loosened and, and the city of Chicago, along with the state of Illinois, will be back to uh, normal at a full capacity. capacity. Of course, the White Sox next home stand, which is later this month against Seattle, I believe on the 26th, uh, they will start the full capacity uh, for fan, for more fans to attend these games. Uh, I can feel the electricity when I was there last weekend, and the players can feel it too, of course. It, it helps you beat up on a bad Baltimore team, and you're winning, and the fans are behind you. But Talk to us about the attitude of those players. It seems like they really embrace the fans getting behind them. Oh, no doubt. I mean, that was one, that was one thing that was noticeable, even down in spring training, uh, you know, as we were talking about with, with, with Eloy, you know, before he got hurt, you know, just to sort of like inter- his interaction with the fans, even from a distance, uh, was, was, was something that, you know, the, the, fan, the, the players – Really like having the fans back, you know, and it's an opportunity for some of these guys, you know, like, like we talked about with Nick Madrigal, like we talked about with mm-hmm. uh, you know some of the guys in the middle, of the league, like a Hoyer or or a, Mar- or a Foster. It's their first time playing with with these type of big fan bases and w- in front of these big crowds, and so so it's another opportunity for them to kind of learn and, and get used to that sort of atmosphere that's, that's going to be you know up kick up another level, like you said, when you get even more fans back in the park, and obviously when you get into postseason play, you know, the, the intensity of those crowds and those situations, the more opportunities that you get to do that now is going to be beneficial for the team down the road as well. And so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's been some incredible buzz back at the ballpark and having the opportunity for the players to, have, to play in front of these fans. I know that they've, they've really appreciated it and really have enjoyed having that opportunity. 
All right, that was Lamont Pope, the White Sox beat writer for the Chicago Tribune. Young man, keep up the great work. Thank you so much for coming on our show today. Uh, great job. Keep up the great work, and let's do this again real soon, okay? Yay. All right, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I had a lot of fun. Thank you, Lamont. All right, thank you. Stay safe. Stay safe. Don't forget. That was Lamont Pope of the Chicago Tribune. He's the White Sox beat writer. Check out his work at chicagotribute.com. You can follow him on social media, Facebook, and Twitter. Just look him up and enjoy his great work. He does a great job. Lakina, since we have a few minutes left in this first segment of the weekend edition of Second City Sports, uh, as we continue the baseball talk, let's head over to the north side. Despite Thursday's loss to the San Francisco Giants, the, uh, the Cubs are currently on their uh, West Coast road trip. Uh, they are currently playing a four-game series against the San Francisco Giants by the Bay this weekend. Of course, they'll be one of the three games uh, featured uh, this coming Saturday on Fox, of course, and then they'll take on the San Diego Padres again uh, early next week. But Lakina, this uh, Cubs team is on the roll again. Wisdom, where's this, where's this guy come from? Uh, Matt Duffy, a, a couple of weeks ago, these unsung heroes for the Cubs continue to impress Lakina. Uh, and looking at their series uh, against the Padres earlier this week, uh, it started on Memorial Day. I know Fernando Tetch, he's junior, didn't play in the series finale on, uh, on Thursday. But this Cubs team is starting to uh, catch fire right now, especially at the plate, Anthony Rizzo. Uh, Javier Baez, Chris Bryant to a, a certain extent, and um, Jack Peterson and Ian Happ, those guys are starting to come on as well. I'm not going to sit here and say the Cubs are finally taking off. They're going to have the NL Central Division on lock, as the kids would say, but this team is really catching fire. They had a great month of May with 18, 19 wins, and that bullpen, as we talked about in the last couple of episodes, it has been key. Uh, they were really uh, uh, another part uh, to them sweeping the San Diego Padres earlier this week at Wrigley. Yeah, I, I was shocked when that happened, the fact that they were able to sweep yeah. you know, the Padres the way they did. I mean, you know, it was also like, you know, yes, you're getting contributions from Rizzo and Bryant, but also you're getting some no-name guys you just mentioned. So it, it's crazy, though. That, um, I mean, yeah, that, that loss against the Giants, you know, aside, you know, yeah, they were they were close. I think, I think Ross, they kind of kept, you know, Zach Davies out there a little too long. That's why Brandon Crawford, who has been, you know, <laughs> Lights out for the Giants. One of the reasons why the Giants are where they are right now. He's one of the reasons why. But uh, besides that game, I think, look, look, they're, they're one and a half up after this recording on the Cardinals. You know, the Cardinals have had their struggles. So once everything opens back up, you know, here in Illinois, and, you know, once it's going to be 100% capacity in a few weeks over at Wrigley, you know, the Ricketts mm -hmm. family, they, they can't cry poor anymore. So, they, they <laughs> mean, look, especially, look, you're not going to be able in good conscience, you know, keep, you know, the Cubs, break up this Cubs team if they're still up two to two or three games on the Cardinals. You're not going to be able to do that. I mean, this might have, you know, you know, it's just to stop some plans that they were trying to do, but I think the fact that this team has done well with, you know, with Duffy, you know, guys like Duffy and, of course, guys like Rizzo and Brian, the usual mm -hmm. suspects, but the fact that they're getting contributions from pretty much everybody, the bullpen's been pretty solid. So, mm -hmm. look, I, I think – look, I'm not going to sit here and say that they're going to be, like, the, the class of the NL Central, but mm – -hmm. excuse me. They're showing you that this actually is a pretty good Cubs, Cubs team. Just saying. Yeah, let's not forget Wilson Contreras who had a monster home run in that series against the Padres as well. His bat is starting to come on as, as well. And so you had to take a look at him. I know that that's one of the names that uh, people are, were speculating the last couple of off seasons whether he was going to get moved or not, or not, along with Chris Bryant and Javier Baez. I, I like the way he's playing right now, especially at the plate in, in, in the Cubs. It seems like things are coming together. Now let's see how they finish up this West Coast road trip before they return home next weekend at Wrigley. As we mentioned, they're currently playing the Giants in a four-game series. Uh, used to be Pac Bell, Ball, Pac Bell Ballpark. I don't know what the hell the name of it is now, but <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, they're playing the Giants out there on the West Coast. And then you get the Padres at Petco for a three-game series starting next week on the road. So uh, the Cubs had one of the best home records in baseball, along with the White Sox, which we talked about uh, uh, 
uh, in the last episode about having one of the best home records in baseball. The, the Cubs, uh, we're starting to see what they're going to be made of as they hit this. Uh, they're currently on this West Coast road trip. Uh, I want to see the started pitching uh, pick up a little bit more. The bullpen has been solid. We talked about that before, Lakina, in our last few episodes. Uh, they're starting to get timely hitting. And the, the sky's the limit, the limit for the Cubs right now. I'm not going to sit here and say they're going to run away with the NL Central because, I, as we said before the start of the season, it's going to be a dogfight, and I expect it to be that way. Pittsburgh's not going to be a factor. Probably eventually since they won't be a factor either, but it's going to be between the Cubs, St. Louis, and Milwaukee. And, and like you said, so, I mean, a bunch of some no names, like we've mentioned, you know, Cole Stewart, who they literally just got, you know, got just that more, that sun, you know, that Sunday. So he able to come in and actually was able to kind of shut down the Padres. I mean, that mm-hmm. who, who thought of that? So, I mean, it, it's great that they're, they're getting contributions from everybody, which is great, I think. But can they keep it up? I know some people are confused mm-hmm. and, you know, can they keep it up? But I would say just enjoy the ride. I mean, if by the end of this month, we're in June now, if by the end of the month, you know, they're still mm-hmm. like two, three games up on the Cardinals, I think maybe you should think about maybe making some moves, you know, to kind of, you know, make, you know, add another bullpen guy, add another bat. You can always use another bat. As Amon mm-hmm. said earlier, I mean, you know, why, why not? Why not go for it? You know, the sky's the limit. Like, look, we said that the Cardinals were not going to run away the division, and they haven't been. The Brewers can still be a factor, mm-hmm. too. They're, you know, the, they and the Cubs are very similar in a lot of ways. So it's definitely, like you said, it's going to be a, a dogfight from the NL Central and should be a lot of fun. Yeah, it will be a lot of fun. That's uh, we broke down the schedule just a couple of moments ago. The, the the Cubs when they turn home, return home next weekend, as we mentioned with Lamont Pope of the of the Tribune, uh, the state and the city of Chicago will be uh, opening up to full capacity capacity uh, at all stadiums, including Wrigley Field and Comiskey Park in Chicago. Uh, I expect uh, Wrigley Field to be at full capacity capacity next weekend, especially you, know, you hosting your rival in the St. Louis Cardinals. So uh, that place should be jumping even more next weekend. As I mentioned to Lamont in our, our interview just a, a few moments ago, I had the privilege to go back to the to the south side at Sox Park last weekend. Even though it was at 60% capacity, it looked like a sellout, okay? And I know the Cubs, uh, if you paid attention closely to uh, that, uh, those home games against the Padres early this week. I know they were at 60% capacity as well. It looked like a full house. Or so um, once things start to open up some more by this time next week, you'll, you'll see more fans attending that ballpark. Wrigley will go back to uh, look like Wrigley. Of course, Sox Park will go to look like Sox Park. You get more fans and then more promotional giveaways will help as well, especially on the south side. So it's great to see both. Uh, first place teams uh, in this town, Lakina. I know some people are dreaming about that Red Line World Series. I would love to <laughs> see it. I don't know what's going to happen. I know our buddy Lamont wanted it to happen last year, even though the World Series was in a bubble in Texas. Thank goodness that didn't happen. So if it were for Chicago World Series to happen, fans would have to be in the sands here on, on Illinois slash Chicago soil. Okay. <laughs> So, but it is great to be a baseball fan. I don't care which team you root for in this town of Chicago. Uh, it's great to see. It looks like uh, uh, the summer is going to be uh, uh, big, even when Bears training camp opens. I know we'll, I'm sure we'll mention the Bears later on the show. But, but you know, baseball will be interesting on both sides of the town. We have two winning teams for once. Baseball City, it, it hasn't happened here in a long time. It's been a while. Baseball City, USA, baby. We'll see if they both can keep yeah. it up. All right, what you know, real quick, what impre- what's impressed you so far during this whole week? You know, because we we haven't talked in you know about a week. So, what impressed you mm-hmm. most this week in baseball? Oh, uh, those Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, they hanging on for dear life in the American mm-hmm. League East. There, the division leaders. I watched some of that series earlier this week against the New York Yankees. They split the four game series on the road. Uh, Gary Cole got touched up on Thursday. Tampa Bay scored nine runs, I believe it was. And so. Uh, Tampa, you should take them seriously, folks. I know they were the World Series uh, runner-ups last year. They're in the America, defending the American League champs. But uh, manager Kevin Cash, who I give him uh, credit to on this show for the last couple of years, uh, and he's doing a phenomenal job. The Yankees, I know they got a big series as we speak uh, going on right now against the, uh, the Boston Red Sox. I know the Yankees have been struggling. It seems like they got their act together uh, after sweeping the White Sox a couple uh, weeks ago, but uh, mm-hmm. they've been going down the two. But I, I, I expect them to make a move at the trade deadline as well. I know we, you know, into the month of June, but I think the Yankees will be fine. They just had to 
put it together consistently on offense. The Boston Red Sox, they struggled early this week down in Houston. I know they got the last game of their series before um, uh, preparing for this weekend series against uh, the Yankees. But uh, Boston, they still hanging around. Of course, on the west, uh, Seattle. Uh, I know they're around 500, but I don't, don't take them seriously. Like I uh, mentioned, Houston, they took care of business against uh, Boston. Mm-hmm. Of course, Oakland taking care of business. So uh, I expect, uh, the, with the exception of the Central, I know Cleveland's still hanging around. I know Minnesota, some people have false hope and they didn't get back in it. I don't see it. But at least in the American League West in the East, for sure, those are going to be the two divisional races I look, I look forward to watch in, uh, in the American League. Yeah, for me, I think it's the National League. The fact that you know the Cubs are, you know, they're up one and a half as this recording on the Cardinals. The Cardinals, like I said, have had their struggles lately too. Mm-hmm. Everyone thought that the well, not not everybody, but a lot of people thought the Cardinals were going to run away with that division. It hasn't happened yet. I mean, the Giants. I mean, you know, they they've kind of they've been hanging in there. I mean, they actually mm-hmm. split the series against the Dodgers last weekend. When you thought, you know, after being swept, you know, the week prior, that people actually had them for mm-hmm. dead, they're still around. The Padres, also the Dodgers. I mean, that could be a thrill. We'll see what those three teams do in the trade. And like, I think that's going to be a going to be a fight to the finish in the NL West. Um, the East is sort of weird because there are six games that separate the, you know, yeah, the Mets from the Nationals. I don't really expect the Marlins to be around too much. I mean, they they. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were swept by the Blue Jays, and they've lost six in a row as of this recording. You know, the Phillies and the you know the Braves and the Mets, you know, maybe the Nationals, too, can probably kind of try to sneak in there. Yeah, they've had their struggles mm-hmm. um, lately, but that's going to be a fight in the NL East as well. So, I, look, I think that as, at this point in the season, you're in a good place for your baseball. The Rays are pretty good. You know, things are opening up. You know, these the capacity of these stadiums are going to be at 100% in the next few weeks. So, and you have a lot of these divisions, you know, all like most, for the most part, really close. So, I think you're in a good place if you're baseball right now. You should be pretty happy. Mm-hmm. Yes, you, sh- you should be. A couple of teams real quick, Lakina. The New York Mets, uh, like I said, I don't know if they're going to hang on in the NL East. Uh, I know they're, they're in San Diego for a big four-game series against – of the Padres, I know they lost their opener on Thursday night, but I'm not really a big believer in the Mets. I don't hate them, but at the same time, as we said before, they're, they're identified by one man, and that's Jacob DeGrom. If he goes down, we know Nora Syndergaard is on the shelf uh, still for, for their uh, starting rotation for the Metropolitans. But I know Francisco Lindor has been hearing it from the fans ever since the start of the season for him mm-hmm. struggling. Of course, he was traded from Cleveland to the Mets during the offseason. And uh, the one team I'm really having a problem with is Atlanta. Yeah. You know I love that team. It's strange. I I was watching their game on Thursday. I know they beat the Washington Nationals. I I know the Nationals are a mediocre team at best. But every time you think Atlanta wins a couple of games in a row, you think this will start to turn the quarter for them. And it's just – it's like two steps forward – one step forward and two steps back. They kind of were the, where the Cubs were this the early in the season, right? I mean, you thought that mm-hmm. maybe, maybe yeah. yeah, you thought that maybe they're starting to turn a corner, perhaps maybe take control of the in the NL East, but mm-hmm. you know they have like these uncharacteristic you know plays and they end up losing these games uncharacteristically. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I hope they can get together. Like I said, they're they're right there. Like I said, the Mets are the Mets are not going to run away with the the East. I've already said that multiple times to people. Yeah. <laughs> so they're not going to do it. I mean, whether it's the you know, the Braves or the Phillies, the Phillies are still like hanging around, they're kind of knocking on the door. They have, you know, they can make some way there this weekend. You know, they have, you know, the Nationals. So <laughs> we'll see, you know, they can, you know, maybe finish up the Nationals and then make it, they can kind of be sort of right there. You know, they got the team to do it. <laughs> so I think Bryce Harper is come. I think Bryce Harper is going to supposed to come back this weekend. I'm not sure, but yeah, that should be a very interesting series. So I'm, look, I, look, I think that, that East is still up for grabs. I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> the Mets, I know a lot of the Mets <laughs> fans are, yes. real, are dreaming, you know, Hey, maybe we can win a division. Let, let, let's slow down here, folks. <laughs> As we wrap up the first segment of the weekend edition of Second City Sports uh, Talk and Baseball, here's the rest of the series that you can look forward to this weekend as we speak. The Red Sox and the Yankees we mentioned earlier. The Cleveland Indians will travel to Baltimore to take on the Orioles. The Miami Marlins will take on the lowly Pittsburgh Pirates. The Nationals and the Phillies will get it on in an NL East battle. The Houston Astros will travel to now Buffalo, New York, and it's Saline Field to take on the Blue Jays. The Blue Jays will be here in Chicago next week to take on the White Sox for three games. The Dodgers, the LA Dodgers in the Atlanta mm-hmm. Braves, as we talked about uh, a few moments ago, they'll, they'll do battle in Atlanta this weekend. 
uh, Tampa Bay and the Rangers will do battle in Globe Life Field. Arizona Diamondbacks and Milwaukee Brewers will do battle in uh, I-90 of the north, north of us here mm-hmm. at American Family Field. I still want to call it uh, Miller Park. Hopefully, if you're a Brewers fan, you get some T-shirts, they call it Miller Park. But mm-hmm. <laughs> I digress. Of course, the Tigers and the White Sox here on the south side. Yours truly, I think, will be attending that game on Sunday. Of course, the Twins and the Royals will do bad on Kauffman Stadium. Cincinnati will travel to St. Louis to take on the Cardinals. Oakland will travel to Colorado to take on the Rockies. Seattle at Anaheim. Uh, the Cubs and Giants, we mentioned from the National League. And, of course, the Mets and the Padres from San Diego. A lot of great series coming up this weekend. So enjoy the baseball, everybody. Um, you yes. Know, now that's first the first half of second season sports. In the post, we got a lot to talk about in the second hour. Sid, we got um, the both the NBA final NBA final contestants from participants from last year have been eliminated. Where do these teams go from there? Big changes in Boston. Um, maybe the Lakers too, or Dame on the move, perhaps. And what else we got, Sid? Hmm. Hmm. Also, we have a hometown guy who's retiring from the world of college basketball. And plus, we'll have other fun. Uh, nuggets as well. Along with Lakina McGee, I am Sydney Brown. You're listening to the weekend edition of Second City Sports. Welcome back to the second half of the weekend edition of Second City Sports Zoom style. Zoom style. Along with Miss Lakina McGee, I am Sydney Brown. You can follow yours truly on the Twitter and the IG at CK80. Once again, at CK80, that's S I D K I D 80. S I D K I D 80. You can follow me at Keenan McGee on the Twitter and at Keenan Scott McGee on the IG. To watch the video version of Second City Sports, you can catch it right here on YouTube at War Media. Once again, at WARR Media. Once again, at WARR Media. Videos drop every, excuse me, Monday and Friday. Once again, every Monday and Friday. Videos drop right here on YouTube at War Media. You can catch our podcast version, which drops every Tuesday and Saturday mm-hmm. at War on Anchor. Once again, at WARR on Anchor. That's every Tuesday and every Saturday for the audio version. We are available on all podcast platforms, including the iHeartRadio app. Just type in a search engine box, WARR on Anchor. Go to WeAreRegalRadio.com. That's our website. And you can follow us on all social media platforms. That's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and right here on YouTube at War Media. Once again, at WARR Media. That's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And thank you in advance for your support. And like, comment, share, and as our good friend George Altman would say, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. We need to put it up on a on a big screen. We got to get that done soon. When we say subscribe, just throw it in your face. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to uh, our <laughs> um, social media pages uh, right here, especially right here on YouTube at War Media. We are unapologetically fun. Let's kick off the second segment of our program. Let's talk about the NBA playoffs. A lot has happened uh, since um, we had our last episode, which was uh, last weekend. Of course, we celebrate Memorial Day along with all of you. Uh, We'll start it off with the Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, The defending world champions are no more. Uh, They're ousted out of the playoffs. Um, their, Their season is over. Uh, uh, they lost their series to the Phoenix Suns uh, in six games by the score of 113 to 100 in game six on Thursday night. Devin Booker led all scorers with 47 points for Phoenix. LeBron James added 29 for the Lakers, nine rebounds and seven assists. Lakina, <laughs> uh, go- going back to uh, game four on Sunday, uh, the, the Lakers uh, looks like they were on their way to a victory. Of course, Anthony Davis gets hurt again. He comes back in game five. The Lakers didn't have it. They were blown out of the water. Of course, uh, game six on Thursday, I, I, I caught the majority of the game. I had other stuff to do. Uh, at the, the, I read the score on my phone at the end of the first quarter of, uh, in game six on Thursday, 48-19. What? <laughs> I was like, what, what is this? It's like, it's like, you're a big brother playing against your little brother on a video game like Madden or NBA Live back in the day, for those of you our age and older. <laughs> you know, you, you, you playing against somebody who's played the video game a couple of times. You played it a bunch of times and you, you slaughtered them. But Lakina, going back to Thursday's game with the Lakers, uh, they showed some fight, but uh, Anthony Davis, who played on Thursday, who should have, not have played, by the way, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's true. They, they, they didn't have it. 
Phoenix, yeah, Phoenix, they didn't have it. Phoenix were the better team. I know Chris Paul was banged up uh, um, early in the series. But uh, Phoenix uh, had the hot shooting. DeAndre Aiden, uh, their big man in the middle, he played great. Andre Drummond did not play for the Lakers uh, in game six. So it turned out to be a great decision, but it wouldn't have meant if you had played anyhow. Right. But Devin Booker had a great series. He was the best player on the floor, on the floor next to Chris Paul for both teams in that series. Uh, Monty Williams, as we told you guys, he was the coach of the year in our eyes on this program. Uh, I don't know if you saw the video following the game on Thursday. Like, and he had a great uh, water um, – they, when they sprayed bad, water yeah. all over him, <laughs> over there, the Chris Paul gave his great speech. So uh, congratulations to Monty Williams. Congratulations to the Phoenix Suns. Uh, they were the better team. They move on. We'll tell you who they're going to play in just a moment. But congratulations to Phoenix Suns. That was their first postseason series win since 2010. And we'll have a new NBA champion this year in the National Basketball Association. Yeah, it's – well, and also, too, that they, I think the Lakers are just a 16 to be eliminated, definite champion to be eliminated in the first round of the playoffs since they expanded the playoffs to a 16-team format. There are also is actually the earliest that the Lakers have actually exited the playoffs in the first round since yeah, all the way back to 1984. You know, that that was during like the Magic Johnson and Kareem Abdul Jabbar. They were both banged up that year. That's why they lost in eighty four in the first round. Well, eighty four they lost the game seven of the finals, so they yeah. had to have been eighty two, eighty one, eighty two. I thought I saw somewhere it was eighty four, but it might it might well, yeah, 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 you know, eighty four they lost in seven oh, games yeah. to Boston like, in the garden. Yeah, so yeah, yeah someone someone yeah, someone messed up on Sports Center there, whoever the statistician was. They it, it, I think it was eighty it was eighty six. I think it was eighty six last in the first round, right? To Houston? To uh, Ralph uh, Stanton? No, uh, he, no that, that Houston series in eighty six was the Western Conference final. Oh, it was Western? Okay. So <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah so it, it had was, to be eighty one to eighty two. No, eighty one because no, they it won 81. in eighty one. Eighty one, they won in eighty and they, 81. I, yeah. and they mm-hmm. it went to the finals in eighty two, they won it all, so We'll, we'll, we'll mm-hmm. figure it out, folks. But, yeah, I mean. Look, this yeah, is like it was the, 81 they lost in the first round. It was yeah. 81, yeah. So someone, someone messed up there on ES, over there at ESPN. But um, it was an awesome See, that's what you listen to us. We give you the correct information exactly, on your Exactly, exactly. But, <laughs> but, you know what, though? Look, I think, I think both can be true. You know, Devin Booker, you know, played, you know, lights out. I think it was like this, mm-hmm. like this, like the second most points that a, a person who scored to knock out a defending champion. You go all the way back to Bob Petit. His 50 against the Celtics, mm-hmm. you know, back you know, in 1958 in the NBA Finals. I mean, seriously, that's how that's how long it was. Yeah. That's how long ago that was. And Let me take a guess at it. And no, folks, I'm not on Google. Uh, Bob mm-hmm. Pettit, uh, yep. St. Louis Hawks. Yes, there you go. Bravo. Hey, hey. Bravo. Nicely done. Yes, and that was actually yeah, that was actually the last time that the Hawks, the Hawks franchise, won the NBA title. Very good, Sid. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, look, I think both could be true that, you know, mm-hmm. Devin Booker, Jay Crowder made some big shots. DeAndre Hayden made some big shots campaign who I don't know where this campaign came from, but <laughs> you know, he made some big shots too. Um, but, but yeah, and, and also, but also to the Lakers after AD went down and look, LeBron is 36. People need to remember that it is his 18th year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, every you know, Montrezl did not play like the the six man of the year from last mm-hmm. year. Kyle Kuzma was banged up. You know, Caldwell Pope, you know, has wasn't very good. Um, mm-hmm. it, it was just yeah. It, and Marcus all was. Then it's true. I believe it's a free agent this summer. Yes. Uh, and he, he didn't won't, be he, there. Yeah, he will not get his money. Uh, you know, Marcus all. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's time for him to retire. I'm sorry. I, yeah. I don't, yeah, him, but it's time for him to retire. It's just the supporting cast, which is not very good for the Lakers, and and that's unfortunate. But you know, look, both could be true. The Suns were the better team, but the Lakers' role players were terrible. I think that's basically yeah. the sum it up. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so there's your quick breakdown right there. I don't know how uh, GM Rob Palenka of the Lakers will rebuild this roster, but they'll they'll, they'll have some changes. Uh, Changes will be made there, up uh, there in California, and Andre Drummond. I know they picked up uh, uh, as a, a pickup uh, in the middle of the season. I don't know he's if he's going to be, be brought back. I like I say, yeah. So he he didn't play in the last couple of games, so I don't think he's going to be brought back. So there goes half your roster right there. So I think the important thing is uh, both LeBron and Anthony Davis. Uh, they help. They'll have at least three and a half months since we'll be uh, back to a normal pattern starting next year with the 82 game set schedule, both those guys will have time to heal up and get ready for next year. And you'll see a better legacy team next year. So 
what the Lakers need is a, is a score, a shooter to compliment, compliment LeBron and AD. And you need a, a big guy who's active, yes. not only offensively, but defensively as well. You had too many guys that just did one thing. You, uh, you didn't have any versatile guys in there. And I think that was a problem too, right? I mean, you, you saw it too. It was glaring the – you know, the the uh, the deficiencies between you know what the Lakers didn't have and what the Suns do have, and in fact, also to their younger overall. So just a, just an amazing uh, job by the Suns. I mean, look, the last time LeBron was eliminated by, his, by a team in his own conference, you know, Luka was only eleven. Anthony Davis was a junior at you know Prospectus High School <laughs> in Chicago, right here in yeah. Chicago. <laughs> you know, Brady only had three rings, and Shaq was still in the league. You know, he was actually playing for the Cavs. That, that's like one of those things where we don't want to talk about. We don't have to talk about that. But uh, <laughs> that, Shaq doesn't either. <laughs> he doesn't want to talk about that. He doesn't want to talk about that. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, look, it's going to be interesting. Uh, we'll talk actually a, a potential player that the Lakers could get. But, you know, let, let's go on, Sid, to the next series. Yeah. Now, the next series in the Western Conference is, is the Denver Nuggets and the Portland Trail Blazers. The Nuggets eliminated the Portland Trail Blazers in game six on Thursday by the score of 126 to 115. Dame Dollar, as the kids will call him, Damian Lillard, led Portland with 28 points and 13 assists. Nikolai Jokic led Denver with 36 points, eight rebounds, and six assists. Lakina, the Damian Lillard had a comment of, According to late great rapper uh, Nipsey Hussle, uh, following mm-hmm. the game on Thursday on his Instagram, uh, just, I'm just summing it up. I don't have the quote in front of me saying, uh, "How long can I wait for the, for uh, opportunity?" Of course, uh, Damian Lillard uh, signed a contract, I believe, a couple of years ago to stay with Portland, and he dropped a 50 piece in Game Five, which was one of the best games in the playoffs. Um, uh, this year in game five the other night, of course, it led to an overtime loss on the road at Denver. Of course, Denver finished off Portland in game six. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, uh, regardless of how you feel about Portland, uh, they were in the Western Conference Finals two years ago. The bubble, they ran out of gas last year. This year, they avoided the play-in tournament, but they went into a Denver team, which is still a good team, but even though they are without Jamal Murray, uh, this Denver team uh, showed up when they had to win in the last two games of the, of the series to take it in six, of course. Now, Phoenix and Denver were face uh, face off against each other in the second round of the playoffs. I cannot wait for, that to fun. watch that series. That's good. That is going to be fun. fun. As uh, Jason Goff, uh, now of NBC Sports Chicago Bulls, pre and post game host, would say, he used to say this back in the day on the radio <laughs> the NBA 80s on Oak. You could turn that up pat, statement up past <laughs> a thousand, okay? I think it's going to be a first team to 150 points is going to win win that series in each of one of those games. I hope that series goes at least six games. I tell you, I wish that series would go seven, but uh, that should be a fun series. Now let's, let's get back to Portland real quick, Lakina. Uh, do you expect Damian Lillard to be moved this summer? I uh, it, strange things, stranger things have happened, but I just don't see it. I that's don't. A, that's a lot of money that they would have to move, right? That they would have to swallow yeah. up for them to move it. I mean, look, Dan's going to be 31 next month. And I'm, look, I think that quotes that, you know, I actually have the quote right here. I think, how should I, how long should I say dedicated? How long till opportunity meet preparation? That's what he posted on his Instagram mm-hmm. what, a couple of nights ago. And, I mean, do you? Who do you think? I mean, I know Bulls fans are probably dreaming, but I, look, I think you know, they <laughs> will have to do a whole lot of like maneuver in order to make yeah. that happen. You know, the Lakers you probably have to get a third or a fourth team involved, but yeah. I don't know that's going to work either. <laughs> and also, too, I also see some people say maybe the Lakers. Like, uh, uh, do, do they have the room? I mean, they need some. They're going to need somebody that kind of like you know take the pressure off LeBron and AD, and they need a, a third guy, uh, obviously. So. But I don't know about that. You know, may, maybe New York, you know, the Knicks, you know, words is that the Knicks have already called about it. Miami, I know our, our girl Lana would love, Tech Iowa would love that. <laughs> Boston, will, <laughs> right? I mean, Boston will get to them in a second, you know, and all the tra- changes that's going to be that are happening there. But I don't know. I mean, if you're, you're 30, if you're a Dave, you're 31, you're going to, look, you've been loyal to that franchise for years. You, get, you signed the contract a few years ago for that big money to stay. You know, you're probably going to try to maybe pull a Giannis, but you get to the point where you say, look, try to give me – and look, C.J. McCollum, you know, nothing against him. He's really solid, but he's not a, he's not a 1A. He's not a 1B guy. He's mm-hmm. not. You know, you don't know how long, you know, how long Carmelo is going to be able to play at the level he's playing. You know, you don't really have a lot. He was of better this year than he was a year ago, uh, even true. though he came out on fire a year ago. Yes, you know that, that's true. But you know, can he keep it up? He's he's on the other, he's thirty four. I mean, at thirty five, I should say mm-hmm. so. 
you know, I don't know if he'll be able to keep it up. And and look, that's going to be the thing where if you're 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 kind of at a crossroads with your team because, you know, you want to stay loyal to the franchise that's been really good to you and a city that's been good to you. But at the same time, though, you know, you don't want to you know be sort of like that train that leaves the station and you're kind of left the guy left behind. Yep, I compared the the Portland Trail Blazers situation to the Utah Jazz situation. By the way, congratulations to the Utah Jazz. They won their first round series against Memphis in five games. They'll play the winner of the Clippers Maverick series. We'll get into game five in just a moment uh, from the, from the other night of Dallas, of Dallas and the Clippers. I had some issues with that, Mm -hmm. but going back to Portland, I compared their situation to Utah. Utah has Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert, but they have a bunch of nice role players. Utah would be a better team if they had that third star. I've been saying this for the last couple of years. Portland, they're in the same uh, situation, okay? I'm not saying there won't be players that won't go play with Damian Lillard. But if you're Blazers management, you got to swing big as far as trades are concerned. Who is there to go get? Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's going to be a thing, right? I mean, the free agency market is not very good, so – you probably mm-hmm. aren't going to have to pull a trade. I mean, I heard like somebody said maybe Golden State for Dame. Like, I mean, yeah, I can see that. I mean, they got a lot of picks, so maybe they could. You know, maybe you may have to get rid of Wiseman and, you know, a couple of your other young guys to probably – and maybe throw in a couple of first-round picks to Portland and kind of like dangle that in front of them. But, you know, maybe. I mean, that that that, that can make him a contender. And then with Clay coming back, I mean, with Steph too, we'll see if Steph can still shoot at this that high level he, sh- you know, he shot at. You know, when, you know, mm-hmm. those last couple of months of the season, that, that could work. I mean, but I think if you're, you're dang, you're, you're kind of like taking your time and kind of like really thinking about what's, what's going on. Yeah, we'll see what happens as the NBA summer. We all know that um, the, even though the free agency is not as hot this year as it has been in years past, uh, we know the in, uh, in these uh, social media circles that things are always cooking, so there will be a lot to talk about. Lakina, uh, uh, as of this recording, uh, the the game six have already been taking place, be, uh, have already took place between the Clippers and the Mavericks. If you're a smart person, you'll see that Dallas won. <laughs> but, <laughs> and the, the winner of this series will take on uh, the Utah Jazz starting this weekend. Lakina, let's go back to game five between Dallas and the Clippers. Of course, the Clippers tied it up last weekend by winning their two road games in Dallas. Game five earlier this week. I forgot who had the ball, Lakina. So if you had the play in front of you, um, fortunately we can't show it right here on YouTube, copyright restrictions and all that. Yeah. But I forgot who, who had the ball for the Clippers. They were down by, I believe, one point. Yep. I forgot who had the ball, but that player decided to pass it off to Nicholas Batum. Yeah. Who, who, what are you doing? I know. You and, had the game won right there. And, I said, no one else is calling and screaming about this. I was like, as we say all the time in football, know your personnel, know the situation. As I always quote the, the great coach, Bill Belichick, Bill Belichick mm-hmm. of the New England Patriots, situational football. You got to know the situation in basketball. I forgot who had the ball for the Clippers. <clears throat> He decided to drive up. He had the clear path for the layup. He decided to pass it off to Nicholas Batum. He missed. He tried to tip it up, missed the rebound. I said, oh, you may have just thrown away your season right there. But the play before then, I don't know if you paid attention. Shout out to our guys, uh, friends of the show, the bigs, Terrence and Eugene. Hopefully we can get them back on the program soon. I was uh, watching their show the other day. They they pointed it out. Uh, you, did you pay attention to Rajon Rondo on the play before when Kawhi Leonard had – I don't think it was the play before when Kawhi Leonard shot that air ball and Rondo yeah. looked at him like he was crazy? Yeah, yeah. That was actually the last play. This should play. tell you all you need to know. That was actually the last play of the game. and you Last know, play of the game. Okay, yeah. So game I digress. And, it was the play afterward, yeah. Yeah, and, and he just, like, shot that air ball. And I think Rondo, I think that meme, like, became famous, you know, now. So, <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, he just gave him the look, like, really? That was a shot you took? Like, I don't know, like, what Ty Lue was thinking with that particular play and that play prior to that. But, look, I mm-hmm. think these are the kind of, these are the kind of uh, those are the kind of dumb plays that can send you home, that can end your season, and mm-hmm. it could very well have happened with the Clippers. They they were right there. They had a chance to win. They actually it, it actually never should have gotten to that point. They were up, I think, by, by mm-hmm. eight points with I think like about seven minutes left in the the fourth quarter, and they still mm-hmm. you know they, they couldn't put the put the Mavs away. 
you know, and look, shout out to the Mavs. I mean, look, they're supporting guys. You know, of course, Luca is doing what he does and is, you know, strained neck. I, I'm not saying he's faking, but I just think that that's. A little... <laughs> I'm not saying the man's faking. NBA conspiracies. It's cause, you know, me and my conspiracy. I'm not. I'm not that person, but I'm just like a little. You know, the fact that look, well, let me let me someone knock me over. You know, with the neck, hit me in the neck for a second, see if I can see how I would, you know, play. But I, I, I mean, hey, you, you can't play doc for this one. Like, hey, I'm not there anymore. Like, y'all look. No, you kid. can't. So, you know, if, if they end up losing, you know, game six, you know, or game seven, you know, this would be tomorrow. You know, if there is a game seven, that would be, I believe that would be on ABC, I think. But, you know, again, that's if necessary. But mm-hmm. I I don't know. I mean, if you're, you know, the lose, you know, both, your, both LA teams lose in that fashion, should they lose? I mean, it's just like disappointing if you're an LA, LA sports fan. You're not, <laughs> you will not be in a very good mood, you know. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. But, I- yeah, I, I, real quick on the Clippers before we move over east. Uh, the, I know some people say blow, blow the team. They're not going to do that. Kawhi Leonard, I know he could opt out of his contract this summer. I know Paul George opted in. He resigned uh, to that new long extension before the season. Uh, before the season, If you're Kawhi Leonard, you did everything possible to go back home. Why would you give up the perks to go to New York or Chicago? Sorry, Bulls fans, he's not coming here. <laughs> Where else can you go? Not too many teams have the cap space. I think the, the, the New York Knicks, I just mentioned a moment ago, have the most cap space this summer. But I don't see the, them uh, having even a prayer of getting Kawhi. Mm-mm. So you basically you stuck with what you got if you're the Clippers. Yeah, and also, too, I mean, I think that the, the supporting people need to step up. Hey, Patrick Beverly, you're making us look bad here in Chicago. What are you doing? <laughs> um, I mean, it's just like the, you know, the supporting guys look Batum, I think – I mean, if they stop making really, you know, inane shots, <laughs> we'll put it, put it that way. Uh, look, PG, you could be, you could do more. I mean, yes, you're, you're doing, look, you're doing what you're supposed to, but you could do more if you want to be something like that elite guy. Um, who else? Uh, Marcus Morris Sr. I mean, look, let's, you know, Zubik, you know, hey, let's get playoff Rondo. Rondo, you only score, yes, you can look the Kawhi funny all you want, but you only score one point. Where's that playoff Rondo we've been, <laughs> we've been, you know, we've, we've seen, you know, in the last decade. I mean, come on. So let's, let's be real here, folks. So let, let, I, I don't think they're going to blow it up, but you, know, you, you never know. I mean, Steve Ballmer may not be in a very good mood. So if you're the Clippers, you better hope you're playing game seven tomorrow. Let, let's just, let's just leave it at that. Yep. Let's head over East Lakina. The New York Knicks, their season is over. The Atlanta Hawks eliminated the, um, the Knicks in five star games. The Atlanta Hawks will play the Philadelphia 76ers. That game will be tomorrow if you listen to us on our podcast version on Saturday. Uh, game one will be tomorrow at 1 p.m., I believe, on ABC. They'll take on the Philadelphia 76ers. Though, of course, Philadelphia eliminated the Washington Wizards in five games. Joel and B, yeah, he, uh, he, uh, it's a game-time decision whether he'll go in game one in that series against Atlanta. But, Ken, quickly, let's focus in on the Knicks. Derrick Rose, Chicago's uh, native son, he had a great series. It wasn't enough. Yeah, I know he's a finalist for Sixth Man of the Year award. Julius Randle had a, a, a great season. Uh, I think he won the Most Improved Player of the of the Year award. Yes. Uh, I know, yeah, he's not a number one guy, and that's okay, but hard work pays off. But if you World Wide West in, in, in the Knicks' new management team, you have some work to do this summer. As I mentioned, they're, they're not going to get Kawhi. Even Kawhi uh, elected to opt out. They're not going to get him. I think they should keep their eye on Donovan Mitchell. I know Donovan Mitchell, I believe, is from the New York area. Mm-hmm. I is. know some people, other people said that uh, maybe add Victor Oladipo. I don't know. But uh, this Knicks team should and, look, and probably will look different next year. Uh, give them credit that brought basketball back to New York for their fans. We'll talk about Brooklyn in a minute. They say eliminated Boston in five games. But for the Knicks, uh, I expect this team to be different next year. The foundation is set with a head coach, Tom Thibodeau. Will they bring Derrick Rose back? Uh, will they make a big trade in the offseason? Who knows? But the Knicks, uh, they had a good season, but uh, hopefully there's more to come if you're a Knicks fan. Yeah, I think, look, the Knicks, I think, did better than I think any of us thought they would. You know, they made the playoffs as a four seed, but, you know, they just – they just didn't have it. They Trey Young is like a man mm-hmm. possessed. So that that was going to be a big, 
you know, big ask, yo, know, for them to be Trey Young. He's the next this generation's uh, Reggie, Reggie Miller, Miller for next yeah. year. Yeah, and you know, Clint Capella had a, a solid out, a solid uh, game as well to you know to finish up that series. So, and then look, let, let's you know, we've seen this movie before, right? With these Coach Tibbs teams, I mean. You know, we'll see what moves they make. You know, do they try to maybe get a Donovan Mitchell? Do they try to maybe get, you know, somebody of that ills? But this team's going to look a lot different next year. If you're D. Rose, do you do you go back and play for Tibbs? Do you go go somewhere mm-hmm. where you could probably try to win a ring? Maybe L.A., maybe back to Chicago. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I'm just saying, you know, well, you, probably, <laughs> you, already got, you already got like Don't a – Don't start there, Lakina. <laughs> I, look, I'm just saying you got two top guys there. He wouldn't have – there wouldn't be no pressure on him to be the guy anymore. So I think that that's kind of like – you know, that's sort of like the like a, a big you know weight off his shoulders, but it will we'll see. It'll be interesting where where he decides to go. But look, I mean, I think the Knicks, you know, I think the foundation is there for the Knicks. We'll see if they can go through. Yep. Uh, and the other series, uh, the Brooklyn Nets, as I mentioned, they eliminated Boston in uh, in, in five games. When in that series, of course, Milwaukee. They swept away uh, the Miami Heat. We talked about that last week uh, during Game uh, Four of that Boston. A, a Brooklyn series, a stupid fan wearing a Garnett jersey uh, attempted to throw a, he threw a bottle at Kyrie Irving. Thank goodness it missed him. But uh, another episode of fans behaving badly, Lakina, that fan was arrested and banned from TD Bank North Garden. Thank goodness. That's all I say about that situation. If you saw inside the NBA uh, last Sunday following that game, Barkley called him a nice, friendly name, which I will not repeat on this program. Uh, this and this old latest edition of you know, don't be a Richard. Let, let's you know, let's <laughs> let's keep there that. You go. <laughs> that. Let's you know, keep that. There you go. We won't talk about that, but and I, I mean, mm-hmm. look, I think Philly, look, Philly did what they needed to do. I mean, that that look, I think you know, it's, it, this that should be a really you know, the Philly Atlanta series. I mean, look, that they'll, they'll probably get swept. I mean, they, I'll give Atlanta a game, but I think Philly's on a mission. Mm-hmm. And yes, even though MB is probably not going to be a hundred percent, probably because he has a fracture, a small fracture of his meniscus. But you know, I, I think I, I trust Ben Simmons. I, I trust Tobias Harris and a lot of the guys on that Billy team. Seth, Seth Curry, not Steph. Seth Curry, the the kid brother. <laughs> um, I, look, I think they could probably win it in five. Now, as far as the Brooklyn Milwaukee series. I mean, I look, I know Milwaukee looked look much better, but that Miami team is sorry, Alana, but you know, it's not that very good. Like let's <laughs> let's be real here. Let's be honest. But uh look, I think Brooklyn's on a mission. I'll 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 give I'll give Milwaukee two. You know, I think I'll have Brooklyn in six. But as long as everyone stays healthy, you know, they're playing like a more of a cohesive unit now with everybody being healthy. I, I just don't see Milwaukee pulling it out. I just don't. How, what about you? Of course. Yeah, of course, game one is tonight on TNT with Brooklyn and Milwaukee. Uh, you just stole my talking points. <laughs> I got Brooklyn in six. Uh, as I said before, Milwaukee, yes. I don't like their head coach, Mike Budenholzer. He fails to make adjustments. You'll see that here in this series. I think I like their roster this year, but this roster is two years too late. They had an opportunity to go to the NBA Finals two years ago when Toronto beat Golden State, of course, in the Eastern Conference Final Series. Milwaukee was up to love on Toronto. Of course, they lost four straight, and their head coach failed to make adjustments. Of course, last year they got embarrassed in the bubble by Miami, who was on a hot streak, and they, uh, Milwaukee failed to get any tough guys. I know they added P.J. Tucker this year. They traded for Drew Holiday, which I like. Me too. I like that trade too. So, I, uh, so like I said, this is a better roster, but uh, th- this is not going to be their year for Milwaukee. Sorry, Bucks fans. I like Giannis personally. He's a very he's a superstar. Uh, he's a very good player, but uh, it, it, as far as who you're going up against, is not going to happen this year until the head coaching change takes place in Milwaukee. They're not going to win a title. They're just not. If you're Giannis, you better flex your muscle and say, "I need a better head coach." Mm-hmm. And there's a few head coaching candidates out there, which I like to see. We'll get to it shortly as we're going to talk about another team who's going to need a, a head coach. But but wrap it up with Milwaukee. Uh, it's, I believe it's going to be a good series, but if, if Brooklyn just stays on course and, and not make any too many dumb mistakes, they should win the series going away. But I'm with you. I'm, I got Brooklyn in six. All right. So it's going to be interesting, too, with the stat, with all the teams that are left in the NBA with the Lakers being eliminated. Last time the Mavs won a title, 2011. Sixers, you know, Dr. J and Moses Malone got rested still in 1983. Bucks, Oscar Robertson, and then Lou Alcindor. 
Ed, we talked mm -hmm. about a few minutes ago, 1958, they were back then the St. Louis Hawks. <laughs> they won the, the championship. <laughs> and the others, the Suns, the Nets, the Jazz, the Nuggets, and the Clippers have never won one. So either you're going to have a team that's going to win their first one or you're going to have a team that's going to end a very long drought, although the Mavs, you know, 10 years ago, that really a big drought. But, you know, well, you'll, mm -hmm. you'll see where we're going with this. But it's, it's pretty cool, you know, they like these kind of things, these kind of stats. You're listening to the weekend edition of Second City Sports, along with Lakina McGee. I am Cindy Brown. As we talk about it, the NBA and the playoffs, Lakina, let's wrap up our basketball portion of this segment. Uh, going to Boston, Danny Ainge, who was the GM of the Celtics for the last 18 years, uh, has stepped down. Uh, he brought the Celtics a title in 2008. Of course, we all know about the moves he made on draft day back in 07. Uh, training for Ray Allen and training for Kevin Garnett, who's now in the Hall of Fame. Congratulations to him. He's Chicago's very own for those yelling at me. He was born and raised in South Carolina. We claim him in Chicago, and he mm -hmm. loves Chicago. Thank you. Yes, he does. Uh, and of course, uh, Paul Pierce was already there, and so and he drafted Rondo, and of course, the rest was history there. Brad Stevens, 354 career wins. I know he changed the culture. He turned that situation around from seven years ago. But I know they were in the conference finals three out of the four years he was there. But for underachieving the last couple of years, Lakina, you get to be the head president of basketball operations. If that's the case, where's my job at? <laughs> <laughs> It, when the, when that news came out on Wednesday, I, I was just floored. Like, well, okay, I, I guess. Look, where where's my job then? If I if I mean, look, you know, you you over you underachieve, I should say, for three years, and then yeah, yeah, let's get get promoted. You know, let's go be a basketball operation, sure. But but you know, you read the reports that apparently he was kind of getting you know disingenuous with that job. That he was kind of getting restless. You know, he really didn't. You know didn't really want to coach anymore. So, you know, give more control by, you know, being promoted to basketball ops. And, look, Danny Ainge, there was another stuff that kind of came, you know, that, that sort of like, you know, some of the comments he made about some stuff that I think that played a part too. I think I'm, I'm just saying. But, mm -hmm. uh, look, as far as the Celtics are concerned, you know, the coaching, I mean, look, there's good, a lot of folks are going to be out there. I mean, look, Jason Kidd's going to be named, it's going to be floating around. Becky Hammond, so people said, you know, but I, mm -hmm. but I think it's sort of like the, the un, you know, un, unwritten sort of like she's going to be a successor whenever a pop decides to retire over in um, I San, so too. Yeah. San Antonio. Mm -hmm. um, some people said Jawan Howard, but he just said like two days ago that he's not going to leave Michigan until they win a championship, so and and, I, and for what I've read, his wife doesn't want to move again. So that that and plus two of their kids are going to be going to Michigan. I think one was going to actually end up playing for him. So I don't think that's yeah. going to happen. <laughs> that's not happening either. So you know, they're, they're, I think that they it's going to be a lot of names that are going to be out there. So you know, we'll see. I, I mean, have, oh, yeah. Go ahead, Sid. Sorry. <laughs> I have two names, and this should be the, these two names should be also could be considered for the Milwaukee job if they do the right thing when they lose this series and fire Mike Boonholzer. He doesn't but, like him at all. <laughs> but for the Celtics, these two names they should consider. Shout out to our uh, colleague Josh, Josh Hicks uh, here at War Media. Sam Cassell, and Ooh. this is the name I'm adding on to the list. I don't know if he wants to do it. I know he just, uh, him and his wife just had a baby recently over the last year or so. David Fisdale. I think that Nick Stank is out mm. of his system now. Yeah, I that would be intriguing, but like you said, you know, would he want to move? You know, since they just had a, his his he and his wife just had a baby, so I don't know if they're gonna want to do that. Um, the Cassell thing, I'm surprised he hasn't been given a, a head coaching gig somewhere. Yeah, he's, been he's currently the assistant coach with the Clippers. Yeah, he's been an assistant for like 15 years now, so I'm a little mm -hmm. surprised no one has given him a job, but. You know, look, I'm, look, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of people that are going to want that job. You know, the, 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 the pieces are there. I mean, you know, we'll see where Marcus Martin ends up going to. You, you got, look, you got, you got Tatum, you know, Kimball Walker. I mean, look, the, I think, look, the pieces are there in Boston. I think they just need somebody to kind of, the, the ingredients are there. That just, you just need somebody there to kind of like, you know, put the right seasoning and, you know, stir it up and stuff. Yeah. So, it'll, look, I, I'm, those are some pretty interesting names. I, I wouldn't mind either one of those names. You shouldn't, if you're a Boston fan, you shouldn't mind those names. Yeah, and also, too, I know Kenny Atkinson's name has been brought up. He was the coach of the Brooklyn Nets uh, up until early last year before the shutdown. He was let, uh, let go. So his name's been added uh, to the list as well. So we'll see what happens in Beantown in the weeks and months ahead as the Boston franchise try to restore themselves to another NBA title. Lakina, let's go over to the uh, – 
Osaki, the tennis player situation. I know she won't play in, in the, in the um, French Open. Uh, she's been fined, and she says she's going to take a, a mental uh, take a break to uh, focus on her mental health. And she says, I know the pressure is getting to her. And uh, we wish her all the best here from uh, our best wishes from both of us here at Second City Sports. Lakina, I, 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 on one extreme, I hear some people say that she's trying to use this to, um, to not uh, face the music. I get where some people are coming from with that, but my strong sense is I don't think she's using this as a crutch. I don't. But on the flip side, I do commend her for raising uh, the awareness of mental health. As I say all the time, celebrities are just like us when they get home and close those doors behind them. And so I think it's a great thing to see that, especially among uh, younger people, that uh, mental health is important. Go take care of it, address the issues that you have, you know, just let your feelings open up because not to get too deep here, but you know, people our age and older, we grew up and say, just tough it out. You don't talk about your feelings. You only do them when you're, backs against the wall you're near death or things to that degree but yeah, i'm glad to see it's not just people that look like us uh black americans but i'm glad to see that all people especially in the younger generation are, are standing up and say hey our mental health is important we're going to take care of it other people should take care of their mental health as well and i totally commend naomi osaka for doing this for you know being you know, being you know upfront about it i know some i've yeah i saw the comments some were saying that well she just used it because she doesn't want to talk to the media and, and look, look. I think they just need to really, you know, Pam Schreider, who's been in this game, you know, been in the game, you know, won multiple doubles titles, mm -hmm. had a good singles career as well. You know, she said, uh, I, I heard on her, um, uh, Keyshawn J. Will and Zubin um, earlier this week, she said, look, they really need to kind of like, you know, change how the rules and how, you know, on how you know, they talk to the media because there are some, there are some mm -hmm. reports, especially overseas, especially in Europe, some of them are not very nice. So, and I think yeah. those people credentials should be revoked. And I think they need to have like a, 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 a sports psychologist, someone there to kind of like talk to them and say, look, if, you know, think about Jennifer Capriar and everything she went through. That was, the, we're talking, this was years oh, ago, yeah. you know, that she, yeah. if only she kind of, you know, she was able to talk about what she went through at such a young age, getting all the success and stuff and her not yeah, being I mean, able to Yeah, I mean, she was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. My late mother used to get Sports Illustrated, so I know these things. Uh, <laughs> she she was on the uh, cover on Sports Illustrated when she was uh, at at the age of 13. Like mm -hmm. you said, she she went through uh, struggles. And she was a public figure, and I, I know she's back, thank goodness, healthy and he healthy and happy now. But, yeah, she, she, she really went through it back in the day. So yeah, so if you don't you don't want Naomi to end up like that, I think this is mm -hmm. probably the best way for her to kind of like take a step back, you know, work on her mental health and and like I think look, I think people need to be more sensitive to that because you know mm -hmm. look as someone who suffers from anxiety, I understand where she's coming from because you know you mm -hmm. don't want to, this is sometimes you just don't want to deal with you know things and you just get get very antsy, you get you know very anxious and stuff. So, yeah. And, and that it, stuff is very real. It is. It happens a lot. Look, Lamarcus Aldridge. That's one of the reasons why he retired from the NBA, but because you know of his mm -hmm. mental health. So, I, I think. Look, I commend all these folks for you know speaking up, and I think people need to be more sensitive to it. And you know, look, mm -hmm. you, you never know that this could this could be you. So I think people just need to be you know yeah. more sensitive to to people on that sense. Yes. Is it the, the job of the athlete to speak to the media? Yes. It's, it's all in their contracts. We get it. We understand it. But I say this all the, all the time and I had to remind myself sometimes too. I'm not saying I'll go uh, haywire or anything like that, but you can have all the success and the money in the world. If you're not happy, you're not happy. No, I don't care I if you have $2 or $2 million in your, in your bank account. Yeah, exactly. You, you have to take care of yourself. We all have to. Absolutely. And <clears throat> We know share our best wishes and you know, get well soon. Hopefully, we can see, we'll see you mm -hmm. on, on the court soon. Yes. All right. So, you know, on the court, though, for the French Open, though, we'll see if Serena can, you know, this has been like the one, one grand slam that's kind of, you know, given her a hard time. She made the round of the 16th for the first time, I think, since like 2018. So, we'll be interested to see what she mm -hmm. does. Sophia Kennan is still around. Um, you know, Victoria Azarenka, who's got a couple of these, I think she'll definitely be a factor too. And on the men's side, we'll see if the, the dog can win, like, for the 80th time. No, I'm kidding. This will be 14 for him. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it'll be interesting to see what, what he does because, you know, he has to deal with Federer and the Djokovic, whoever. Who thought that that was a good idea, putting those three in the same part of the draw? 
you know, I'm sure NBC is not very happy because they won't have a collision course in the finals. That was dumb, but that's a whole other story. But <laughs> so should be should be fun, you know, the, this next week in the French Open. Yeah, it should be fun. As I always say, Lakina, when can we have a, a, a male American that could be dominant? The last time the closest to is Andy Roddick. He had the success that many people thought he should have. But uh, we need to go back to when we were kids, Pete Sampras, mm-hmm. Andre Agassi. <laughs> That's yeah. been a long time, at least 30 years. Yeah, it, it's been a while on the men's side. And, and look, the players are there. It's just that we got to deal you gotta deal with you know you said i deal with Djokovic, federer and Nadal, and then you know got tm2 now so uh, i don't know it's it's yeah, we gotta get somebody on to talk tennis i mean that there someone someone's gonna be much better at this than i am so <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, better than both of us yeah this both is better us. than both of us so we'll we'll hopefully we'll get that person at some point but let's talk about coach k for a second Around the yes. same time the same time like a couple of hours after the boston all of a sudden boston's came out it was also announced that, you know, Mike Krzyzewski, the legendary coach over at Kentucky, has decided that he's going to retire after this coming season. And John Shire, you know, Glenbrook, Glenbrook's own, will take over. He'll be the coach in waiting. Um, 24 straight 20-win seasons and 12 30-win seasons. That's the most by a Division One head coach. And has five national titles, second most, of course, you know, after, you know, after John Wooden. And, of course, you know, this is all still, you know, being written about 1,170 wins. That's the most, most ever, most right now ever for a head coach. So, Sid, what do you think of, what do you think about this news, first of all? And do you, what, what do you think about John Shire, you know, taking over? Uh, I'll take, as, as Jonathan Hood of the ESPN Chicago would say, I'll take the second question first, you know, mocking mm-hmm. uh, athletes. Uh, John Shire, uh, not, I know he was on Coach K's staff for the last several years. He was the head of recruiting, recruiting those big stars to come to that school. So I thought that maybe Tommy Amaker would get a look or Johnny Dawkins would get a look. I know both of them served under Coach K for a while. So um, I know Chris Collins, he's here in Chicago coaching Northwestern. So uh I thought those two names, the previous two names I just mentioned, I thought, thought they would get a serious look. But, hey, John Shire, congratulations. You you have a, a lot of work ahead of you, young man. So we'll we'll see what happens with that. Now, Coach K, I believe he's in the Basketball Hall of Fame. He's not. He will be there he soon. Is. He's already there. Uh, he's already there? Okay. Yes. So, uh, yeah, of course, he has three gold medals, including that um, – um, the 92 team, he was an assistant coach with Lenny Wilkins and P.J. Carlismo on the 92 dream team, the original dream team. Mm-hmm. And so uh, he, he has been a great uh, co- coach for USA basketball. And, of course, in college with the Duke, um, numerous uh, conference titles and um, in national titles. Uh, the only thing I took away from this was Lakina. The way that college basketball is changing with the players can basically transfer whenever they want. And as we all know, that Coach K was not a fan of the one in Durham mm-hmm. rule. He had to do it to keep money in his pocket and money, most importantly, the money in the university's pocket. Mm-hmm. He didn't want to do it, but to keep up with the Joneses, as they say, he had to do it. Sometimes it worked, but most times it didn't. So uh, the, the game of college basketball has changed over the last few years. Uh, and it's, it's changing again. And so that's why one of the reasons why you saw Roy Williams of, of North Carolina stepped down. So, you know, this, uh, this um, news will eventually come one day. I didn't think it would be this soon, but a hey, congratulations to Coach K on a great career. Uh, it's going to be a, a, a circus for sure this upcoming season. This is going to be the last time he does this, the last time he's, he does that. Uh, how will he coach uh, the team? Uh, what will the players do uh, in, his, in his honor? Will they actually win a championship? Will his last game be uh, – um, in the final four on a final four stage, but we shall see because they didn't have the talent last year. As we all saw, we, we also too, they wanted to cancel their season just like the women's team, but that didn't happen. The women's team season was canceled. The men's team went on. So uh, he kind of saw the hand uh, writing on the wall and this is the perfect time for him to go out. Yeah. Let's, I'll talk about the uh, role quick about Shire for a second. He's the son of a coach, you know, they, he won a, a state title when he was at Glenbrook North. I remember because I believe they, I believe they beat Simeon that year, or no, it wasn't. It, he he beat they beat one of those city teams that year. Um, look, he won a national championship. You know, ten. You know, in, in twenty 
10, 2010, yeah, it was 2010. I had to make sure it was one of the, it was one of the Butler, but Butler was uh, the, one of the, um, the, the finalists. You know, this is a guy that helped recruit Jason Tatum. This is a guy that helped recruit Zion Williamson. So he knows, he knows how to get those big time players to come to Duke. I mean, Zion probably could have went, you know, overseas somewhere, but decided to come to Duke because of John Shire. Um, Look, I think it's going to be it's, it's going to be tough, no doubt, because the climate is a lot different. I mean, look, we all remember what happened when um, Corey Maggette, if you remember, in 99, when he left that his freshman year. You know, Coach K, you know, yeah. was not very happy because, you know, that never happened to him at his school. I think and, Alger Brandt did, too. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was like, that's a couple of years. That was a few years later. But, yeah, and, you know, that's, you know, he had to kind of, you know, adjust to perhaps getting those one-and-done guys. You know, he actually won <laughs> his most recent championship. He won. With a with a lot of one done guys with the you know, with you know Jaleel Okafor and uh, Tyus Jones, so I, I mean mm-hmm. it's it's look I think look I think look I think that he's definitely in the Hall of Fame and look as for Shire look it's going to be tough no doubt for him and him and Hubert Davis and look we'll see I mean the climate's changing in college hoops look look Jim Beheim of Syracuse said look look you're gonna have to drag me out of here <laughs> he already said I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Look, he'll, he wants to coach till he's 80, so I, I believe when he says it, and I also believe when he says you're going to have to drag him out if he, if he, if he does try yeah, to be. Yeah, so, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, it's just, just a different, you know, everything's just so much different now, so in the, in the college hoops aspect of it. I heard uh, Reese Davis from ESPN, who does a great job covering both college football and college basketball for them. He said, look, college basketball is going to have a hard time with these, these top coaches leaving, these legendary coaches leaving, so and he might be right. Yeah, is that absolutely right? The game is changing, as you mentioned, and over the last several years, looking if you paid attention, especially in this past year's tournament, especially with the success of the University of Houston, I think believe in there the the American Conference or Conference USA. American, would correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. American. But they, they made it to the fi- American Conference. Thank mm-hmm. you. Um, they used to be in Conference USA, yes, but that's true. <laughs> uh, they made it to the fi- they made it to the Final Four this year. You notice over the last several years. These uh, smaller and mid-major schools, I hate using those terms, but let's keep it a buck, as the kids would say. Mm-hmm. These mid-major schools and those smaller schools, those players say stay together three or four years. Yep. They make it further to the NCAA term, and they give these big schools trouble. We saw yep. that here in Illinois. Loyola, congrats to Porter Mosley, now the head coach of Oklahoma. Uh, you saw what happened there this year. So <laughs> this shouldn't be a surprise, folks. This trend's been happening for the last several years, and that's why you, mm-hmm. one of the main re- reasons why you're seeing these legendary head coaches go out because this one-and-done rule it, um, it, it's here to stay, folks. I know the NBA is getting involved with that with the G League. There's only a few slots open to those guys that opt, that opt not to go to college. They can uh, travel with the G, uh, G League team for a year before they get drafted. And so there's only a few slots open for that. There's yep. always going to be room for college basketball, okay? So college basketball isn't going anywhere. But uh, the, the game is changing. As I mentioned earlier, uh, if you're not getting enough playing time or for whatever reason or some other special circumstance, you could transfer at any point. You don't have to sit out a year. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Lakina, but you don't have to sit out a year. No, and not so, anymore. So this is, is a headache for these big-time coaches. So we'll see how, how these current coaches will adjust to that. Yeah, it's going to be an adjustment too. So yeah, we'll we'll see. I mean, look, I think all the numbers I mentioned with Coach K. I mean, look, they're not. You know, he's not he's not going to retire until after the season. I think about and he's been upfront about. It. He said, "Look, I would not have gotten this far after you know after a few years. He didn't have a good first few years at Duke. If you go back, it didn't. He didn't. He really didn't. And mm-hmm. the day you know the idea that at the time I keep forgetting his name, but." He's, he, he stuck with them because if you remember the class that, that changed Coach K, kind of like the 30 for 30 style, you know, you know, you know yeah. Jay, Jay Billis said, you know, they, he and, you know, Allery and their girlfriends at the time went out with one of the boosters because one of the girlfriends, you know, was, you know, father was a booster there. He said that we're thinking about firing yeah. him. And, you know, they, no, they stuck with them. The AD stuck with him and, you know, the rest was history. So, yeah. In this climate, he would not. He's and Coach K, you know, was truthful. He said, "Look, I know, I know, I would not have gotten this chance in today's climate." So I'm, I'm. He's grateful, and look, he'll he wants to spend time with his grand. He's got ten grandkids now. He wants to spend time with him, mm-hmm. you know, but with them, you know, his wife and their daughters, and they all live very close by in North Carolina. So 
you know, I, I commend him. And look, we'll, we'll do this next year once, <laughs> once you know, the, as the season yeah. goes. But we're going to do the, you know, the, the retirement tour and whatnot. But it'll be interesting. But so, you know, salute to Coach K, and we'll see what, you know, good luck to John Shire because I don't think he'll need it. But he'll, I think he'll be just fine. Yeah. Salute to Chicago's very own. You're listening to the weekend edition of Second City Sports. Lakina is she, Sid is me. Lakina, we have about an, an, less than a minute and a half left. Our last story, the USFL is mm-hmm. making a comeback. They'll be on Fox this time next year in 2022. It will be an eight-team league. Uh, the rosters and the cities will be announced at, at later dates. Fox holds a small ownership piece in the league. Of course, for those of you that uh, missed uh, the 30 for 30 uh, special of the original USFL league that formed back in the early 80s, uh, mm-hmm. go check that out. Your ex-president now uh, was involved in that and those other factors in there as well. But you haven't looked at that 30 for 30 uh, documentary. Who, you should. Who killed the USFL? Go, go look for it. You really should. It, was ve- it, was, it was very good. It was, I believe it was one of ESPN's very first documentaries. One of the it first was. five or six documentaries that they got released many years ago. So ch- check that out. But, Lakina, I know we had the spring league that's kicking off now for this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, XFL is coming back next year. And, uh, of course, the USFL is, is – starting up next year, this new version of XFL that, uh, starting up next year. Is it too many football leagues doing the NFL offseason? Will you even watch? Excuse me. I might, I might check it out, I mean, just to see how it looks. I mean, look, I think this is definitely going to be reserved for guys that are probably their practice squad guys to keep themselves in shape. I mean, I'm sure they're mm-hmm. going to put an age limit. You're not going to see a lot of 18, 19-year-old guys try to you know, play in the, in the USFL or any of these mm-hmm. leagues. It's not going to happen. They've already, I think they're, I think like, I think the couple of these you just mentioned, I think they're like, you have to be at least 22 or the very least have a, at least have had three years in college, you know, playing college football is one of the requirements. Mm-hmm. And so I'm sure it's going to be very similar for the USFL. I'll, I'll probably check it out. I mean, look, I think the, the guys that keep in shape, will, will there be viewership? That's going to be the thing, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, yes, I'm sure they're going to be streamed in various, you know, places and stuff like that, but I just don't think there's going to be a big appetite for for them. I mean, it might be like one spring, one spring football league too many. That's just my my opinion. What do you think? I think it's one too many as well, but it'll open up more more jobs potentially to potential draftees, the people that were, excuse me, for the players that were not drafted, and like you said, the, the, the players that were put on waivers or what have you. Uh, hopefully, the, uh, I was listening to another show, and they brought up a great point. This was since the NFL is participating in this woke culture. <laughs> uh, hopefully, it'll open up uh, some more opportunities for HBCU player football yeah, players. Sure, of course. Uh, before um, the uh, integration in the late 60s into the 70s, uh, black players were going to predominantly HBCUs, and they were getting drafted left and right. Of course, yeah. the mainstream universities like Michigan, Alabama, Ohio State started letting black players in only because they needed. Uh, those players to win and we'll we can go on about that but we'll say that for another time yeah but hopefully it'll open up doors especially for HBCU players because when was the last HBCU player to be drafted in the first round I'm just going off of memory I thought about this earlier this morning Steve the late Steve McNair out of Alcorn State in 95 yeah, yeah, you might be right. Yep, that's probably the last time someone – and look, all the HBCU guys, you know, Hall of Famers, you know, Mike, Michael Strahan, which is HBCU, mm-hmm. he's a Hall of Famer. Jerry Rice, you know, yes. HBCU guy, Hall of Famer. Walter Payton, you know, probably the most yes. famous. Uh, Aeneas Williams, you know, he was – people forget, yes. he was the HBCU guy. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I like the fact that, you know, the NFL seems to be kind of like – you know, sort of – Mel Blunt and Jackie Slater. Mel, oh, we'll a couple of other good ones too. So, yeah, so I, you know – I, I like the fact that maybe the NFL is becoming more and more. I think they're doing like a, a big a, a class, kind of like a HBCU classic to feature some of the top players from those HBCU schools to kind of let the scouts sort of look at them and kind of give them kind of like their old senior bowl, which I think is pretty cool because th- those guys are yeah. lost in the shuffle. And I think, look, I think these leagues are, these spring leagues are perfect for, like you said, for those types of guys, you know, also D2 guys or D3 guys or NAI guys that probably would, yeah. probably would not have a chance to play in the National Football League. So, you know, I, I say, look, more more power to those guys and more opportunities for those players. Yeah, those players uh, are showcasing the bright in the in the right light, and the, uh, those players who who stand out the best and the most, they'll get invites to training camp, NFL training camps down the road. So, we'll see what happens with these spring leagues as uh, they get going over there. Uh, 
they, uh, they do this the right way they uh, and they operate the correct way and they have their finances in order before they start AAF or whatever the hell that leak was a couple of years ago. Yeah, something they like couldn't that. pay their bills and this, <laughs> yeah. right? They, they spent it after two, three weeks. So uh, have suit, your financial yeah. house. Yeah. Yeah. Have your financial house in order. And like you said, like, you viewership will be the key. All right. So, whew, boy, so we, we talked about so much today. Sid. I know. <laughs> we hadn't talked, had talked in about a week. So, you know, it, it was, you know, yeah, we yeah. a little bit for a little bit over, but that's okay though. You can follow me at Keenan McGee on the Twitter and at Keenan McGee on the IG. <laughs> You can follow yours truly, Sydney Brown, on the Twitter and the IG at CK80. Once again, at CK80. That's S I D K I D A zero. S I D K I D A zero. You can follow this podcast, Second City Sports, first right here on YouTube at War Media. Videos drop every Monday and Friday. Once again, videos drop, new videos drop every Monday and Friday right here on YouTube at, at War Media. Once again, at W A R R Media. You can find our, <coughs> excuse me, our audio version of this podcast. It drops every Tuesday and every Saturday. Or at War on Anchor. Once again, every Tuesday, every Saturday for the audio version at War on Anchor. We're we are available on all podcast platforms. Make sure you type in that search engine box, W-A-R-R on Anchor. Go to our website, weareregalradio.com. That's W-E-A-R-E-R-E-G-A-L radio.com. And you can follow us on all social media platforms. That's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and right here on YouTube at War Media. Once again, at W-A-R-R Media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Thank you in advance for your support. Like, share, subscribe, and tell your friends. Yes, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. We got to get it on this big screen one of these days. You know? got to <laughs> get that coordinated. Coordinate your face. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And don't worry, folks. We'll talk about the NFL and some of the stuff that's still going on with Aaron Rodgers and Julio Jones, the latest on, on that. You know, as they go into mandatory mini camps, we'll start, which start next week for a lot of these teams, including the Bears. Will so both of them show up? Yes, exactly. So you know, don't don't worry. We have not forgotten. But you know, we're, look, we had a lot of other stuff to talk about, so it's fine. Mm-hmm. But even still, though, for Sid, I'm Lakia. This is XC Sports Zoom style, and we'll see you next week. We're back. Till next time, holla!